pursuant to notice. And the subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on how opportunities and obstacles to security cooperation in the Middle East, uh, on the opportunities and obstacles to security cooperation, and how encouraging regional security cooperation between American partners and allies can help advance stability and American interests in the region. Uh, I see that we have a quorum. I will now recognize myself for the purpose of making an opening statement. Um, I, will, um, I will be perfectly, I want to be up front with my colleagues to say this being my, ha my last hearing, my opening statement may go slightly beyond five minutes, but only slightly if the ranking member uh, is okay with that. No objection. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Also, before I start trying to keep it as close to five minutes as possible, uh, I, and I would like to extend a warm welcome to our witnesses, Ambassador Dan Shapiro, Andrew Exum, Linda Robinson, and David Schenker. Thank you for joining us today in what will sure be, surely be uh, an incredibly timely and critical discussion. But most importantly, I think for the first and last, first and last time, I would like to welcome to the hearing room and to everyone watching virtually, uh, Jill Deutsch, Gabby Deutsch, and Serena Deutsch, uh, my wife and daughters. Um, and uh, our son Cole may be watching, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna shout, give him a shout out also, but um, it is nice to have them here. Uh, and um, I will, recognize them later for questions. Um, <laughs> now, <laughs> uh, the good news is I never need to recognize them. They always feel free uh, offering uh, questions and comments, uh, but I'm grateful to have them here. Uh, as my tenure in Congress comes to a close, I've taken time to reflect on how I've changed, how the country's changed, and how the world has changed. And throughout my time serving on and then chairing the Middle East, North Africa, and Global Counterterrorism Subcommittee, the one constant has been change. Some of these changes have been challenging and heartbreaking. The loss of life during points of high tension between Israel and Hamas sparked by Hamas rockets launched at civilians. The humanitarian catastrophes during the conflicts in Syria, Yemen, Iraq, and Libya, some of which continue to this day. The near escalation into open conflict between US and Iran, and of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. But in many moments, too, the change has signified hope and progress from the spirit of democracy and freedom during the Arab Spring to the signing of the Abraham Accords. When the US sponsored Abraham Accords were signed in September 2020, we could not have realized the incredible and cascading impact that it would have on the region and on Israel's relations with its neighbors. I was incredibly proud to have been on the White House lawn when the Abraham Accords were signed, a momentous occasion and one of the highlights of my time in Congress. The Abraham Accords made official what had been covert security ties between nominal enemies and set the stage for full-fledged partnerships on issues related to security and business, the environment, innovation, tourism, and so much more. Egypt and Jordan formally recognized Israel in 1979 and 1994, respectively. And there, I want to take a moment to recognize what hasn't changed. That's the importance of this piece and it should never be taken for granted, nor should the immense leadership that it took on all sides to make peace possible. Jordan and Egypt continue to be important partners of the United States and Israel and are vital to the security and prosperity of the entire region. It remains abundantly clear that there is a commitment to continuing to advance these new relationships for the greater good of the region. I know that the Biden administration is committed to pursuing new normalization agreements and that many of us stand ready to help them succeed, just as many of us Democrats and Republicans alike supported the agreements when they were signed by the Trump administration. Normalization between Israel and Arab states is not a substitute for peace between Israel and the Palestinians, however, nor have we claimed it to be. Rather, these new ties present an opportunity to work together with regional partners to strengthen the Palestinian economy and continue to invest in people-to-people -people ties that help break down barriers and create pathways to lasting peace. I've been a staunch supporter of the Nita M. Lowy Middle East Partnership for Peace Act, and I've been so proud to witness the deep relationships that Palestinians and Israelis have built together, and I'm eager to see what more can be done alongside our partners in the region. 
It is clear that these strengthened ties have ushered in a new era of opportunity for regional security cooperation, especially as the U.S., Israel, and our Arab partners in the Middle East share a common adversary in Iran. Iran has made its intentions to destabilize the region and wipe Israel off the map clear since before I came to Congress. When I arrived here, we were negotiating the toughest sanctions ever imposed on Iran. That was more than a decade ago. And today, Iran enriches uranium to 60 percent, something the IAEA Director General says only countries intent on building nuclear weapons do. To this day, Iran remains the world's largest state sponsor of terrorism and continues to support the terrorist proxy groups throughout the region. These groups, which Iran gives hundreds of millions of dollars to every year, have been responsible for the bombings of the U.S. Marine Barracks and Embassy in Lebanon, the attacks on the Israeli Embassy and EMEA Jewish Center in Argentina, the rocket barrages from Gaza that killed countless Israeli and Palestinian civilians, and too many other terrorist attacks to list. And they have amassed more than 150,000 rockets, Hezbollah has, in South Lebanon, all pointed at Israel. What's more, the Iranian regime abuses the human rights of its own citizens and continues to wrongfully detain Americans for political gain. Siamak and Bakr Namazi, Morad Tabaz, and Ahmad Shargi are Americans currently being held in Iran. And my constituent, Bob Levinson, was the longest held American hostage in history, believed to have died in captivity in Iran. A clear message must be sent to the regime that its practice of unjustly detaining Americans for political purposes is unacceptable and that the regime will be held accountable and punished for this illegal and barbaric behavior. Iran must immediately release all current wrongful detainees, provide closure to the Levinson family on what happened to Bob, and commit to finally ending this horrific practice once and for all. Frozen Iranian assets should go directly to victims and their families to fund damages won in U.S. courts from the Iranian regime. And Iranian assets should replenish the already established U.S. Victims of State-Sponsored Terrorism Fund. So as the international community has negotiated with Iran to re-enter the JCPOA in recent months, Iran's malicious and dangerous behavior has continued throughout the Middle East. Now, just this week, Iran's president, Raisi, denied Israel's right to exist on American television, denied the reality of the Holocaust. Raisi, who was under U.S. sanctions for in his involvement in the 1988 systematic slaughter of thousands of political prisoners in Iran and other human rights abuses, is currently in New York to attend the U.N. General Assembly. I support the Biden administration's commitment as reaffirmed in the Jerusalem Declaration to never allow Iran to acquire a nuclear weapon and to use all elements of our national power to ensure that outcome. And as we review any potential deal, there are three fundamental questions that must be answered. First, if a nuclear agreement is reached now, what is the path forward to a longer and stronger deal that addresses other aspects of Iran's malign behavior and never allows them to possess a bomb. Second, on balance, does greater insight into Iran's nuclear program and dramatically reduced enriched uranium in Iran outweigh the immediate impact a deal would have on Israel, our partners, and U.S. troops as billions of dollars start flowing directly to the IRGC to be used for greater and more lethal attacks. And three, as Iran sits with so much enriched uranium today, what is the plan with our allies right now to stop Iran from having nuclear weapons with or without a deal? Support for any deal must, at a minimum, depend upon satisfactory answers to these three open questions. These questions arise at a time when Iran continues to pose an existential threat to the international nuclear nonproliferation movement as it inhibits the IAEA's monitoring capabilities and continues to violate its safeguard obligations while rapidly advancing its dangerous nuclear program. This amplifies my concerns about how any nuclear deal can be verifiable and enforceable. But even as Iran continues its violent and destabilizing behavior, 
the United States continues standing with our ally Israel and working alongside our partners across the Middle East to strengthen our collective defenses and invest in progress. I'm proud to have devoted my seven terms in Congress to strengthening the U.S.-Israel relationship and building diverse coalitions that support that relationship. I'm grateful to former chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Howard Berman, who immediately upon my arrival in Congress allowed me to work with my colleagues to help impose biting sanctions on Iran. Together with my friend and colleague, former HVAC chairwoman Ileana ross Leighton, I secured the passage of the U.S.-Israel Strategic Partnership Act and the U.S.-Israel Security Assistance Authorization Act to dramatically expand cooperation between Israel and the United States. These pieces of legislation passed with robust bipartisan support, which reflects the long-standing commitment to the U.S.-Israel relationship and of ensuring Israel's security. This is an exciting time in the Middle East. The Abraham Accords have rewritten the geopolitical environment and a more cooperative era has begun. Israel's transition from European command to CENTCOM's area of responsibility is an important cornerstone of this new era. And it's already provided new opportunities for multilateral cooperation aiming to strengthen regional security, especially against the shared threat of Iranian drones, ballistic missiles, and Iranian-sponsored terror. Last October, an American uh, B-1B strategic bomber flew over key maritime choke points in the Middle East amid ongoing tensions with Iran, with jets from Bahrain, Egypt, Israel, and Saudi Arabia alongside it. Israel participated in the International Maritime Exercise, which is a massive American-led naval exercise that included Abraham Accord countries as well as several countries Israel does not have formal ties with. And then in the Eastern Mediterranean, Israel's growing cooperation with Greece and Cyprus has contributed to greater stability and opportunity. Seamless military interoperability between U.S., Israel, and our partners in the region is of utmost importance to strengthening and expanding security coordination. And as Israel's relationship in the region grow, so too do the opportunities for this crucial security coordination. I'm eager to hear from our witnesses today about the current security landscape across the Middle East, what momentum exists to strengthen collective defenses, what a regional security architecture could look like, and how these efforts will best counter our shared threats. And I want to close by saying just a few more brief words of thanks. First, to Chairman Meeks and Ranking Member McCall, thanks to both of you for leading the Foreign Affairs Committee with passion, drive, and a deep bipartisan commitment to strengthening American leadership around the world. Thank you uh, to my staff, uh, the staff of the full committee, and the staff of this subcommittee, but especially, uh, especially uh, my staff, Sophie Mervis, the staff director, Jack Steinberg, professional staff member, Casey Custon, longtime uh, go-to, former staff director and longtime go-to on all things Middle East uh, for staff across Capitol Hill. Uh, thank you for what all of my staff and our staff as a whole uh, does to make this committee work seamlessly and to make the work of this House work the way it does. And thank you to my colleagues on the subcommittee who have served uh, alongside me and will continue to underscore the value of our partners across the region and the importance of the U.S.-Israel relationship. Finally, a big thank you to my colleague and friend, Ranking Member Joe Wilson of South Carolina. Joe, it's been a pleasure to serve alongside you and to champion this important work together. Uh, I have learned so much from you and from all of our colleagues on this committee about your commitment to U.S. leadership in the world, about your commitment to advancing U.S. values, about what this committee and what this Congress can do to further both. Chairing this, uh, chairing this uh, subcommittee on the Middle East, North Africa, and global counterterrorism has been an enormous honor and privilege. And I hope that our efforts here will continue to reverberate in capitals throughout the region after I leave and as all of you continue this important work. Um, that, I, um, I, appreciate, uh, I appreciate my colleagues for applauding the fact that I finally concluded, and I am pleased to yield, <laughs> pleased, pleased to yield five minutes 
uh, to the ranking member, Mr. Wilson of South Carolina. Uh, legally, that was just five minutes, I, I, I noticed, okay. Um, Chairman Ted Deutsch, thank you for holding this important hearing today on regional security cooperation in the Middle East and North Africa. It is fitting that your final hearing would be on such an important topic. Your legacy and service on this subcommittee is one of bipartisanship, and I have been grateful to work together with you on significant initiatives, such as the Libya Stabilization Act, the Mines Act, the Basim Barabandi Rewards for Justice Act, and, and many others. And so there are a lot of specifics that can be cited, not just uh, in generalities. I wish you well on your upcoming endeavors, uh, though your departure will be a loss for Congress, but I'm uh, grateful to see it's going to be so positive for the family. So this is good. Uh, security cooperation between the United States and our regional partners is critical to confronting evolving challenges in the region and beyond. Normalization between Arab partners and Israel is essential to achieving mutual goals of countering malign influence and extremism. Over the last decade, with the opening of the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem, and particularly since the signing of the historic Abraham Accords, we have witnessed unprecedented progress toward Arab-Israeli relations and cross-sector collaboration. I was grateful to be with Chairman Ted Deutsch at the White House with President Trump for the signing of the Abraham Accords. Even countries that are not formal signatories have signaled an increased willingness for regional cooperation to address shared security concerns. Countering the terrorist regime in Tehran is and will remain a top priority for both Israel and our Arab allies, as well as the United States. Iran's growing missile and UAV program, in addition to its proliferation of regional terrorism, pose a direct threat to peace in the region. The existence of the people of Israel as they promised to vaporize the people of Israel, and U.S. national security interests at home as ICBMs are being developed. Iranian-backed terrorist groups soon are going to be, could be empowered with sanctions relief, which would continue to wreak havoc in the region. In Lebanon, with Hezbollah launching rockets at Israel, Hamas launching more than 4,300 rockets from Gaza into Israel, and Yemen, with the Houthi rebels firing at Saudi infrastructure and against the UAE using missiles and drones clearly uh, marked in English, made in Iran. In Syria, Iranian-backed terrorists back murderous Assad and target uh, U.S. forces. In Iraq, Iranian-backed terrorist groups like the Badr organization Vi for Power also targeting U.S. forces. The list goes on as Iran provides drones to war criminal Putin for the murder of Ukrainian citizens. With the addition of Israel into CENCOM, I'm grateful to see joint exercises conducted between the United States and our Arab partners, now including Israel counterparts, to increase interoperability. We must continue multi-pronged efforts to deter aggression and to facilitate increased communication in the event of an act of aggression by the Iranian regime through its proxies. There should be peace through strength. I am currently working on a bill to expand the authority of the Middle East Regional Cooperation to further regional normalization, counter anti-Semitism, and promote integration between Arab countries and Israel. This effort builds on the progress of the historic Abraham Accords and growing trends within the region to form ties beneficial to research and development, anti-extremism efforts, and security cooperation. I a safer, more prosperous MENA region benefits everyone. We appreciate the witnesses for their time being here today and expertise. And before we yield back, another highlight of my service was to accompany Chairman Deutsch to Krakow, Poland. Uh, sadly, Auschwitz broken now, but then to go to uh, Jerusalem um, for the uh, Holocaust uh, remembrance. Uh, it was such a meaningful experience, and uh, I, I will always cherish uh, having that opportunity. And again, uh, Look forward to his continued service on behalf of our country. I yield back. Uh, thank, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, to the ranking member. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate that very much. Um, thanks again um, to uh, all of our witnesses for being here today. I will, um, uh, I will recognize the witnesses, and um, you will have an opportunity to summarize your testimony. Uh, I'll recognize all of you. First, the Honorable Dan Shapiro is a distinguished fellow at the Atlantic Council's Middle East Programs. 
He previously served as U.S. Ambassador to Israel from uh, 2011 to 2017 and as a senior advisor to the State Department's Special Envoy for Iran from August 2021 until March 2022. Ambassador Shapiro also spent much of his career working in senior positions here in Congress, uh, including uh, on behalf of the people of Florida in Senator Nelson's office. Uh, Mr. Andrew Exum is a partner at Hacklett & Company, a management consultancy firm in Washington, D.C. Mr. Exum previously served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Middle East Policy where he was the principal advisor to the Secretary of Defense and Under Secretary of Defense for Policy on International Security Strategy and Policy for the Middle East and for oversight of security cooperation programs in the region, including foreign military sales. He also served four years on active duty in the U.S. Army in Afghanistan and Iraq, and uh, for that we are grateful to your service. Thank you for being here. Uh, Ms. Linda Robinson was a senior policy and researcher and director of the Center for Middle East po Public Policy at Rand Corporation until September 2022. She has previously testified multiple times before Congress on the Middle East, special operations, and U.S. successes and failures <clears throat> in the long wars. Before she joined RAND, Ms. Robinson was a foreign correspondent for U.S. News and World Report and a senior editor of Foreign Affairs Magazine. And the Honorable David Schenker is a senior fellow and director of the Program on Arab Politics at the Washington Institute. He previously served as Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs from 2019 to 2021, where he was the principal Middle East advisor to the Secretary of State and oversaw the conduct of U.S. policy and diplomacy in the region. Before joining the State Department, Mr. Schenker was the director of the Program on Arab Politics at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Uh, I could not imagine uh, a more talented and insightful uh, group of witnesses than the one we have here today. I will now recognize the witnesses for five, min five minutes each. Without objection, your prepared written statements will be made a part of the record. Uh, Ambassador Shapiro, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Wilson, members of the subcommittee. Thanks for the opportunity to testify today along such uh, distinguished colleagues. And as a point of personal privilege, Mr. Chairman, uh, as you prepare to transition to your next chapter, I want to thank you for your leadership in Congress and on this committee uh, on these important issues and wish you well. Uh, building on the peace treaties with Egypt and Jordan, the Abraham Accords between Israel, the United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain, and the normalization agreement between Israel and Morocco have opened the door to a qualitatively different Middle East. Today, I work at the Atlanta Council, heading up its N7 initiative, sponsored by the Jeffrey M. Talpins Foundation. We bring together senior officials and experts from Israel and all six Arab states that have announced normalized relations with it in conferences aimed at building multilateral connections across these states and generating actionable proposals to positively impact the lives of their citizens. I've chosen to engage in this work because I think it's critical that the United States seize the opportunities to advance U.S. interests presented by the Abraham Accords and to do so in a way that enjoys broad bipartisan support. I'll make five key points, each of which I expand on in my written testimony. First, there's no going back. The leaders of the normalizing countries are acting to advance their own interests. They see opportunities to cooperate more fully with Israel to deal with shared adversaries, chiefly Iran, to gain access to Israeli technology, to partner with Israel in key sectors like health, education, energy, tourism, and agriculture, and water, and to advance narratives of tolerance and coexistence that they embrace. It does not render the Israeli-Palestinian conflict irrelevant, nor does it mean that these Arab states no longer care about achieving a two-state solution, but it does mean that they were no longer willing to sublimate their own interests to efforts to resolve an utterly stalemated conflict. The Trump administration deserves due credit for helping shepherd these agreements to reality, but the UAE, Bahraini, and Moroccan interests were the drivers. Fortunately, the Biden administration has recognized the significant opportunity they inherited and has moved to embrace and advance it, even as more can be done. Second, the trend of normalization will not stop with the countries that have undertaken it so far. Other Arab states, seeing the beneficial effect on the interests of the first movers, are likely to follow suit, and the Biden administration has undertaken a number of such discussions. During President Biden's recent visit to the Middle East, Saudi Arabia commenced allowing Israeli civilian overflights of Saudi territory, a positive step, with full normalization likely to come later. Regardless of the timing of the next countries, the trend ref reflects a deep attitudinal shift underway, certainly in the Gulf, but finding its way to other parts of the region as well. Arab leaders are increasingly describing it as only natural that Israelis and Arabs would live and work together, both reflecting and encouraging a different outlook, especially among younger Arabs. Third, normalization between Israel and Arab states presents significant opportunities to advance U.S. interests in the Middle East and beyond. By being the key partner of the new coalition emerging in the Middle East, supporting the normalization trends and providing necessary security guarantees, the United States gains in two ways. First, 
we are best positioned to ensure that the coalition is as aligned as possible with U.S. interests, emphasizing that U.S. partners need to stand with the United States when its most important interests are challenged by Russia and China, whether in Ukraine, on Taiwan, or in the Middle East itself. It also provide, improves policy convergence on regional issues around which we and our partners have sometimes differed, including the imperative to prevent an Iranian nuclear weapon, how to do so, and the need to sustain the viability of an Israeli-Palestinian two-state solution. On the latter, I would argue that the Abraham Accords are currently the only potential source of positive energy in the Israeli-Palestinian arena, and in that regard, they should be viewed as an opportunity. Second, a cohesive regional coalition helps enable a sustainable U.S. presence in the region. Three consecutive administrations have expressed the American people's desire to avoid new major military entanglements in the Middle East. But we are present, and we must remain present, to protect our own interests and our allies and partners. With regional states taking the lead together in tending to their own security and non-security needs, the United States can be, an active, can be in an active support role, but not always at the tip of the spear. Fourth, looking beyond normalization, it's not too early to think broadly and long-term about models of true regional integration. One of the best, in my view, is from Southeast Asia. While an ASEAN-style regional organization in the Middle East is aspirational at this point, it's possible now to put in place some of the habits, practices, and exchanges that could improve prospects for its development over time. Building on the Negev Summit and the launch of the Negev Forum, the United States should encourage its regional partners to begin a regular interwoven series of meetings of counterpart ministers of energy, health, trade, education, tourism, water, agriculture, and defense. Civil society organizations and private sector entities could organize themselves in forums that mirror the work of the governments. Negotiations should commence on an area-free trade agreement, building on the FTA signed by Israel and the UAE. Countries outside the region, including U.S. partners in Europe and Asia, could be invited to attend meetings as observers and, over time, establish partnerships with the regional group, as India has already done in the I2U2 forum. The goal is to draw many more elements of Israel's and Arab states' governments and societies into the process of integration to demonstrate deeper and broader benefits to larger shares of their populations, and to hold up this regional grouping as a club that others want to join. The net effect will be an ever-thickening web of ties, expanding constituencies for peace and cooperation, including security cooperation, and rendering a return to conflict virtually unthinkable. Fifth, in my written testimony, I list a number of specific initiatives the United States can undertake to help sustain momentum, address a range of regional priorities, and capitalize on the opportunities to advance U.S. interests. In the interest of time, I won't repeat them here, but these and many other initiatives would benefit from scaled up and broadened U.S. participation, which the administration and Congress can encourage, encourage via the Nita Amaloe MEPA program, NIH, the Departments of Commerce and Energy, the Development Finance Corporation, other federal agencies, universities, the private sector, and NGOs. Finally, I want to commend the important work of the House and Senate Abraham Accords caucuses. These caucuses and their leaders, which include members of this committee, are doing critical work to establish advancing normalization as a priority issue meriting sustained bipartisan support. Mr. Chairman, or Ranking Member Wilson, thank you again. I look forward to answering any questions the committee has. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Shapiro. Uh, Mr. Axum, you're recognized. <clears throat> sure. Well, Chairman uh, Deutsch, Ranking Member Wilson, thank you again for another opportunity to testify before your committee. Over the past several years, I've come to admire members of this committee on both sides of the aisle and the sober way in which this committee approaches its work. And that is why I was so distressed to learn, Chairman Deutsch, of your uh, retirement at the end of this Congress. I will not repeat the expletives I uttered to the committee staff when I learned about this. I will say that you've been a remarkable servant for the American people, and I just think it's an inspired choice by the, uh, the board of the AJC for you to take the helm there. Uh, I wish you all the best, and your family all the best as, uh, as well. I know Ranking Member Wilson and the rest of this committee will miss you deeply. Uh, I want to speak to you today in what hopefully will be plain English about our interests in the region and some opportunities we have before us. Uh, I'll pay a special attention to the security environment in the Gulf, given this hearing's focus, and can answer more questions during the Q&A. Uh, successive administrations have, perhaps to their own surprise sometimes, repeatedly affirmed in various speeches and white papers what they view as the core U.S. interests in the region. They are security of the Arabian Peninsula, security of the State of Israel, countering terrorism, and weapons of mass destruction. People always think I'm crazy when I say this, but the United States has actually done a pretty good job defending those interests over the past 50 years. Now, whether we've done so in a cost-effective manner, I think is another question entirely. But both Democratic and Republican administrations have been very cautious about changing anything about the way we do things. The reality is, is that policymakers have always feared the unknown risks of disruption, 
more than the known risks of the status quo, and as a result, our force posture in the region, to give one example, has remained remarkably robust. But I think the Trump administration's legacy is somewhat interesting and perhaps creates opportunities for the Biden administration and other successor administrations. And as one example, the Trump administration, I agree with, with what Dan said, deserves great credit for brokering normalized relationships between Israel and both the UAE and Bahrain. Although the legitimate aspirations of the Palestinian people do seem to have been a little forgotten in the process, the economic and security opportunities presented by closer ties between Israel and her Gulf neighbors should be a cause for celebration. If we truly care about both the security of the state of Israel as well as the free flow of commerce in and around the Arabian Peninsula, a partnership between Israel and the UAE, especially two of the most dynamic economies in the region and arguably the two most capable militaries, is a good thing for U.S. interests. Going forward, the Biden administration should build on the positive momentum created during the Trump years. The administration should build pressure on those Gulf states that have not yet normalized relations with Israel, pointing out that Bahrain and the UAE will now benefit from closer commercial ties that those other countries, and we won't name names, are missing out on. But I also think that the UAE especially will benefit from closer security ties with Israel. I've spoken to this committee before about the way in which our efforts to develop the region's various militaries have frankly not been very successful. Despite roughly three decades of effort since the end of the Persian Gulf War, most of our would-be partners in the Middle East still struggle to stand on their own militarily. The Saudi-led war in Yemen has been a tragedy for the people of Yemen and to the people of southern Saudi Arabia, but it's also cast a harsh spotlight on our Gulf partners as military actors. Bluntly speaking, despite billions of dollars having been spent, mostly, I should add, by the Gulf states themselves, most of our partners cannot make a meaningful contribution to even a U.S.-led military coalition. And this is unfortunate, obviously, because our Gulf partners can and should be able to defend themselves. The Islamic Republic of Iran is not 10 feet tall, and neither was Saddam Hussein's Iraq, for that matter. You should not need 35,000 troops uh, permanently garrisoned in the Gulf to defend the sea lanes that our regional partners have a greater economic interest in defending than we do. Yet for the most part, our Gulf partners have not made a serious effort to build effective military services within their own countries, and they have shown little interest in working together in a way they would need to in order to deter Iran on their own. But here the UAE stands out. Under Mohammed bin Zayed, the UAE has built some very effective air and special operations forces. The Emirati military is very much like Israel's own military in this regard. The is Israel's military, which let me, let me remind you is still a largely conscript force, isn't good at everything. But Israel has invested with considerable U.S. assistance in those areas, missile defense, air forces, special operations forces, that give it a decisive advantage over both its neighboring states and Iran's proxies in the region. The UAE and Israel have a lot in common, and I would reckon their leaders are going to make a good faith effort to quickly deepen the security ties between the two countries. And I myself was moved to see the Emirati foreign minister at Yad Vashem, Israel's museum and memorial to the Holocaust in Jerusalem just last week. These deepening ties create an opportunity for the United States and also a dilemma. Clearly, the United States would love to see a competent military partnership emerge between our two closest partners in the region. But I always say that the danger of creating independent military capability in the, your partners is that you create independent military capability in your partners. I have no idea which direction Israel and the UAE might choose to take their new partnership. Will their interests be aligned with US interests in the region? Most of the time, probably, all of the time, I doubt it. Both Israel and the UAE have a history of what we might call military adventurism and what they would surely call looking out for their own interests, regardless of what their most important partner might think. Not only the Biden administration, but future administrations would do well to stay tightly lashed up with both Israeli and Emirati leaders. A closer partnership between our three nations will allow for greater burden sharing in the region, allowing the United States to devote more hard resources elsewhere. But at the very least, we need advance warning when our partners head off in more, shall we say, entrepreneurial directions. And we'll only get that if we take the time to walk alongside both states as they develop closer ties. And with that, I'll pause for further questions. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Exum. And uh, next we will go to Ms. Robinson. You're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Deutsch, Ranking Member Wilson, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on security cooperation in the Middle East and North Africa. I'll briefly summarize my prepared statement. Over the past three administrations, the U.S. has been somewhat fitfully recalibrating its posture and approach to the Middle East. I co-authored a study published by RAND last year, Reimagining U.S. Strategy in the Middle East, 
which sought to identify effective and cost-effective ways to rebalance the current investment of resources and attention to produce better outcomes. A key premise of this study is that the U.S. has important enduring interests in the region. One of our recommendations was to invest more time and energy in an enhanced regional security cooperation framework so regional partners and allies could do more and to decrease the need for U.S. military action. We suggested exploring a Middle East version of the Organization for Security Cooperation in Europe, or OSCE. An OSCE-like option would offer these specific features. It would be an inclusive organization that includes non-Arab regional powers and a cooperative multi-issue approach to managing and reducing conflict. This will be distinct from a NATO-like collective defense treaty organization with an Article V commitment to mutual defense. That option appears infeasible given the divergent interests of the regional players and the outside party's lack of incentive to make such a commitment. Creating an OSCE for the Middle East would be a valuable long-term project given that the region lacks an inclusive organization and is plagued by numerous conflicts. In the short term, however, there are three current opportunities to improve security cooperation. These can be pursued simultaneously, and they can be part of an incremental process to build a region-wide organization. The first opportunity is the expansion of the Abraham Accords normalization agreements from a purely bilateral process into the multilateral Negev Forum. This forum includes recent signatories, Israel, UAE, Bahrain, Morocco, as well as Egypt. Thus far, the participants have agreed upon an annual ministerial and formed six working groups on issues ranging from regional security to clean energy, food and water, economy, health, education, and coexistence. Our Peace Dividend RAND report calculated the benefits that could ensue from this normalization process, and it demonstrated that benefits would be largest through not only expansion, but a plurilateral rather than bilateral approach. The second opportunity is an informal expansion of the Gulf Cooperation Council. The GCC met this July in an expanded plus three format that included Egypt, Iraq, and Jordan. These three countries already have a trilateral economic mechanism, and they share security interests with the GCC, albeit from their own perspectives. These countries have all engaged in a flurry of bilateral and back-channel diplomacy that can be built upon, built upon, including outreach to Turkey, which has been reciprocated by restricting uh, support for the Muslim Brotherhood, and outreach to Iran. The third opportunity is the creation of a long-sought integrated air and missile defense system that the U.S. Central Command is heavily focused on. Israel, which is now part of the CENTCOM area of responsibility, has participated in these discussions. This initiative aims to create a combined defensive system to provide early warning and protection against drone, cruise missile, and ballistic missile attacks, which have been increasing in frequency and precision. As a defensive system, this initiative is non-escalatory. It can have a broader deterrent effect against other types of aggression by demonstrating will and capability to act together. Effective defense and deterrence can also foster creation of a diplomatic arms control track that the region needs for a long-term comprehensive approach to stability and security. Many obstacles impede the promise of these initiatives, among them ongoing widespread anti-Israel sentiment, the festering Israeli-Palestinian conflict, regional divisions, including differences among GCC members, and the chronic conflicts and structural drivers that are endemic in the region. The region runs a serious risk that it will continue to fall behind without robust job creation, economic diversification, improved governance, and serious climate action. This hearing is a valuable opportunity to explore these long-term stakes for the U.S. and for the region. I would like to conclude by noting that sustained effort by the U.S. and others will be needed to accomplish the promise of these opportunities. And it is noteworthy that Congress has contributed bipartisan legislation, including the Israel Normalization Act and the aforementioned MEPA, Middle East Partnership for Peace Act. I'm prepared to answer your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Robinson. Uh, Mr. Shanker, you're recognized. Mr. Chairman, 
Ranking Member Wilson, it's an honor to appear again, once again, before the subcommittee. On the occasion of, of your last hearing, Mr. Chairman, I want to take the opportunity to express what a pleasure uh, it's been to appear before you and the subcommittee, uh, both as a think tanker and uh, as a government servant. Um, thank you for your service and leadership, and all the best to you in your, your uh, post-government life. <clears throat> Two years after the Abraham Accords, nearly a third of the Arab states have now elected for peace with Israel. One of the more promising outcomes of this new regional dynamic is unprecedented regional cooperation and potentials for burden sharing. What is de uh, developing is significant, but it's much less than the Arab NATO evoked by King Abdullah. Rather, it's a U.S.-supported regional strategic cooperation initiative focusing on countering Iranian missiles and drones involving the sharing of radar information and the integration of layered missile defense systems. The so-called Middle East Air Defense Alliance uh, is already, according to Israel's defense minister, operational and thwarting Iranian attempts to target the region. While the current trajectory of strategic cooperation between Israel and the Arab states is unprecedented, however, there remain significant obstacles to building out an effective operational alliance. First, inter-Arab rivalries. Arab states do not get along particularly well. The Gulf Cooperation Council, or GCC, is characterized more by competition than, than cooperation. Historically, there's been very little military cooperation between these states. Regional rivalries and, and mistrust may undercut efforts to forge closer cooperation with Israel. Public versus quiet cooperation. Uh, the Abraham Accords and normalization with Israel uh, are not popular in the Gulf and the Middle East writ large. In the aftermath of the Abraham Accords, Arab states' dealings with Israel have become more overt, but some reticence remains. I believe Riyadh will inevitably normalize with Israel, uh, yet until now the kingdom has kept its reporting de dealings with Israel quiet. And last month's disagreements between Israel uh, about making a phone call between Israeli interim uh, Premier Lapid and Qatari Foreign Minister uh, uh, Sheikh Mohammed Abdurrahman Athan, he scuttled plans for opening an Israeli consulate in Doha during the World Cup. The hesitancy of some Arab states to go public with strategic cooperation may make it difficult to position Israeli equipment and or personnel in non-Abraham Accord states. Israeli officials' predilection for leaking will not reassure states still undecided about upping the ante. Antagonizing Iran. To a greater or lesser extent, Arab states have concerns about popular opinion related to normalization with Israel. These states are equally, if not more, apprehensive about how Tehran will respond to st closer strategic cooperation with Israel. Uh, since 2019, uh, the IRGC has repeatedly warned Gulf uh, states about pursuing security ties with Israel. Early on, Abu Dhabi sought to preempt these threats by announcing it would not allow Israel to base uh, military aircraft on the territory. Uh, while radars are not as menacing as F-35s, uh, uh, I'm sure uh, these will also be seen as problematic by Tehran. The key question uh, for these Arab states is how closely uh, can they coordinate with Israel until Iran responds, either directly or via its proxies. Then there's the question of sharing what with whom. Strategic cooperation between Israel and its Arab partners is a positive development. At the same time, however, some of Israel's best potential partners in the region have increasingly close relations with China. If Israeli equipment, some of which has been co-developed with the United States, is deployed abroad, Measures will need to be taken to ensure the technology is not compromised. Some of the Arab states that Israel is hoping to strengthen its strategic cooperation vis-a-vis -vis Iran uh, are also currently leading the efforts to help Iran bust U.S. sanctions. Uh, finally, um, uh, to conclude, the, the regional security partnership uh, between Israel and the Arab states has great potential to help Washington's friends uh, and allies in the Middle East better defend against a growing Iranian missile and drone threat. But it's important to have reasonable expectations as to the limitations of the cooperation. While the Arab partners are at best non-democratic, if not authoritarian, they still have considerations about public opinion. Furthermore, the capabilities of many of these Arab states remain limited, uh, as Andrew Exum said. Um, Israel, as well, continues to lack sufficient capabilities in aerial refueling and ordnance to accomplish certain missions vis-a-vis -vis Iran. In this regard, while helpful, uh, the Middle East uh, Air Defense Initiative is no panacea. The new strategic architecture made possible by the Abraham Accords is an important new element of burden sharing, but it's not a plan B for when Iran truly becomes a threshold nuclear state. Even if regional strategic uh, cooperation achieves its full potential in defending against the missile and drone challenge, 
the United States will remain the ind indispensable ally of its regional partners in countering the Iranian nuclear threat. And um, with that, I'll con conclude, and I'm, I'm pleased to take your questions. Uh, thank, <coughs> excuse me, thank you very much, Mr. Shank, and thanks to all of our witnesses for their excellent testimony. I will now recognize members for five minutes each. Pursuant to House rules, all time yielded is for the purpose of questioning our witnesses. And uh, because of the hybrid format of this hearing, I'll recognize members by committee seniority, alternating between Democrats and Republicans. If you miss your turn, please let our staff know, and we will circle back to you. If you seek recognition, you must unmute your microphone and address the chair verbally. Uh, I, will, um, uh, I will reserve my time until the end, and uh, therefore we'll start by recognizing Mr. Cicilline of Rhode Island for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I want to begin by thanking you for your extraordinary leadership of this subcommittee. I have the privilege of serving with you both on this committee and on the Judiciary Committee and feel particularly blessed by that. You are beloved as our chairman of this subcommittee. You leave an extraordinary legacy of um, wisdom and bipartisanship and of making a real difference uh, in this region of the world. And I, we all know that you are going to do great things at the American Jewish Committee. And we look forward to continuing to work with you. You will be missed. And uh, you have heard me say this before, but you are one of two people that I look to when I have difficult votes on the House floor as sort of my North Star because of your thoughtful and wise and serious work on both committees with which I serve you. Um, and just want to wish you well and say how much you're going to be missed. I also want to say welcome to Jill uh, and to Serena and Gabby. Uh, and uh, I know they're incredibly proud of the work you've done on this subcommittee, but on the work that you've done in Congress and our Looking forward to the next chapter of your life with them. So bravo to you. And AJC's win is our loss in so many ways. Uh, thank you to the witnesses for your um, really important testimony. I, I want to begin um, where you sort of left off, Ms. Robinson. You know, we've obviously seen the Iranians in so many different ways use their proxies to create instability and, and, and to undermine American national security interests in the region. And, I'm wondering where you see sort of the best opportunities for regional security cooperation and Ambassador Shapiro, if you could also speak to that kind of what are the impediments to that, both within the Abraham Accords, outside of the Abraham Accords, and um, you know what are the what are the impediments to the kind of architecture that you describe, Ms. Robinson, and what can we do to facilitate that? Yes, thank you very much for the question. I, I would start by saying that the third opportunity, of course, is the narrowest, but I think the most um, direct way of addressing that question, and that is uh, to work on this coordinated uh, early warning and protective system to defend against the UAV uh, cruise missile and ballistic missile attacks. And it will be um, by choice, right? As we've all, I think, acknowledged, there are there's hesitancy uh, across the region to engage in this open cooperation with Israel. But with CENTCOM in the lead, I think it's very possible that there will be uh, an increasingly coordinated, multi-layered uh, defense system that over time can expand and grow. So I think that is a central priority, uh, as I understand it, of, of the administration and U.S. CENTCOM as the uh, action arm. And we've seen, I think, a lot of um, discussions below the radar that will allow uh, for this to progress. The, uh, as mentioned, I think, by David, of course, there have been some actions taken through the coordination involving countries like Iraq. So even though, for example, Iraq has a law recently passed uh, punishing any overt coordination or cooperation with Israel, uh, I think there's a lot that can be done under the radar. There's also technical uh, challenge very much. And this is where it's very interesting to see the Israeli technology may also become uh, a key factor in building this, uh, that countries can acquire the uh, now in test phase iron beam, iron dome, the multi-layered system, and this could provide another avenue for protection beyond uh, what the current Gulf states investment are largely focused on the Patriot and Thads. Thank you. Thank you. Ambassador Shapiro. Congressman, uh, my colleagues have spoken to this very uh, thoroughly. Uh, I'll just add, uh, obviously, the limits on the capabilities of some of the key partners uh, is a challenge. Uh, the internal mistrust uh, among them uh, is a challenge. 
Uh, the Israeli technology uh, that uh, Linda just referenced, uh, certainly uh, it can be a, a key part of the uh, building out of this multilateral architecture, uh, but there is a debate within the Israeli uh, defense technology community on the wisdom of sharing technology, even with its newest friends. Uh, there are, these relationships are close, there is warmth, uh, and yet uh, questions remain about the ability or willingness to properly safeguard those technologies. Uh, questions remain about the relationships some of those countries are building with China and perhaps backdoor uh, pathways that that technology might find its way where we would not want it to. There's also the difference of views among them about the uh, desirability of apparently provoking Iran. As much as Israel and the Gulf states share uh, a fear of Iranian uh, aggression and uh, in many cases are share criticism of U.S. policy uh, if it's about the Iran nuclear deal, they do not share uh, the same approach uh, on how to posture themselves. The UAE has been very clear. Uh, even now, uh, by uh, continuing to trade with Iran, uh, even where sanctions would otherwise not permit it, by uh, opening up its, returning its ambassador to Tehran, that it is seeking uh, to maintain channels of dialogue and avoid being in a provocative uh, posture that doesn't quite match the Israeli uh, attitude about Iran. So those are some of the challenges. Clearly, CENTCOM is the right forum uh, to pull all these actors together, uh, build the trust over time with the countries that Israel has normalized with and those it has not. Uh, build out those, uh, those mutual uh, technology capabilities uh, and try to come up with the common strategy even when they have these different approaches. Thanks so much. Uh, my time has expired. I yield it back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cicilline. The gentleman from South Carolina, the ranking member, Mr. Wilson, is recognized. Thank you, Chairman Ted Deutsch, and I love saying Chairman Ted Deutsch. Anyway, thank you for your service. Uh, Mr. Uh, Secretary Exum, uh, with your uh, DOD background, U.S. allies in the region uh, have in the past years come under repeated attack by Iranian drones and missiles, thousands of rockets uh, in uh, Gaza with Hamas, thousands of rockets in Lebanon with Hezbollah, with actual attacks on the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia. Recently, Israel and the United States and regional partners have been discussing a regional air defense security alliance to counter Iran's UAVs and missiles. What are your thoughts on the proposed alliance? How could this further U.S. interest in security in the region? Well, thank you. First off, it's, it's a great question and, and one that, frankly, you know, Linda and Dan should also weigh in on, um, and, and, and David as well. I think actually David made some really good points about the things that have stood in the way of integrated air and missile defense, you know, historically in the, in the region. Um, if you were to ask CENTCOM and you were to, you know, look through kind of how we've done in terms of building partnership capacity in the region over the past 20 years, that might actually be a bright spot. Uh, believe it or not, um, the, the, still the challenge has historically been is that, you know, for integrated air and missile defense, and again, I'm not a physicist or, or, a, uh, or an Air Force veteran, but it's one thing, you know, it's, think of it like a baseball. If the baseball is coming at you, it's harder to see than if you're actually over on the side, you know, viewing it from, a, from an angle. And so being able to talk to one another is in some ways more important than just being able to talk to the United States. The thing that stood in the way of integrated air and missile defense historically has been kind of unwillingness that, that David mentioned to talk to one another, to have deeper security ties. It's the trust gap that exists. I think also, um, you know, Dan raised this point, which is that a lot of the um, technologies that we have developed uh, in partnership with our Israeli uh, friends have been remarkable. Um, you know, Dan and I uh, were part of the team that negotiated the last memorandum of understanding with Israel to further that work. Um, I completely understand why the Israelis would be very reticent about sharing some of that technology. Um, and then third, and I think Linda's a better expert on this than I am, which is this separate issue of just not just kind of um, the conventional air, uh, missile threat that Iran poses, but the more unconventional missile threat, so uh, drones, for example, or shorter range rockets. I don't think there's a quick fix on, on that, unfortunately, but, but perhaps Linda may have some, uh, some, some better ideas. Well, actually, the insight by all four of you on that particular question was very, very helpful. Uh, and then, Secretary Schinker, I believe that uh, we're in a conflict between democracy's rule of law and authoritarian's rule of gun. Aggression has first begun in Ukraine with uh, war, Putin, criminal, uh, war, Putin, war criminal Putin. Uh, but hey, we know Taiwan's in danger. We know then uh, the sequence continues in that Tehran uh, almost weekly uh, boast of uh, vaporizing the people of uh, Israel as they uh, proceed to uh, chant uh, death to uh, Israel, death to America. And so to me, uh, Ukraine victory is just so crucial. Uh, how has the 
unprovoked war by Putin against the people of Ukraine impacted the calculus of our Arab allies regarding purchase of Russian uh, munitions? Well, thank you for the question, Representative Wilson. Um, you know, it's a little bit early to say. Um, there are different categories of, of Russian equipment. Um, clearly, uh, the performance on the ground in Ukraine um, has shaken the confidence in, uh, in armor. Um, um, as for the aircraft, I think we're still seeing uh, countries moving ahead with fifth generation um, Russian aircraft, um, as well as the S-400, famously, um, anti-ballistic uh, missile system. But I, I think you're gonna see in terms of uh, ground and armor and artillery, I think you're gonna see um, a real, um, real slowing of Russian military sales in those areas. Well, that would be very positive. Of course, hey, we can look at the example of the Ferris wheel uh, that uh, Putin designated this week, uh, the largest in Europe, uh, except it didn't work, and they had to refund the tickets. Uh, so hopefully people around the world see that. Um, additionally, uh, which Middle East partners have actually transferred weapons to Ukraine? And uh, we see today war criminal Putin uh, is mobilizing young, more young Russians to be sacrificed for his personal gain of oil, money, and power. And, uh, and which countries, uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, have been helpful? Uh, well, I, I can't give you a, um, a menu. Maybe uh, Andrew Exum will have further information on that. I know uh, countries that have been unhelpful, um, which is Iran, providing uh, drones to, mm -hmm. to Russia, uh, that we're seeing some of them being downed now in Ukraine, but these are uh, suicide drones, and so they will uh, perhaps ultimately have an impact, um, although uh, not decisive in the, in the war, but, but certainly cost Ukrainians their lives. Again, thank you each for being here today. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I thank the ranking member and recognize Mr. Malinowski for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to start with a, a word of uh, bitter protest, um, and, and namely that I, I believe we should all get at least an extra minute to be able to say nice things about you at this uh, hearing. Without objection. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I will, I will uh, use the, the fake minute you just gave me to just uh, say that I, I cannot think of anybody who, who could have been a, a better chair of this subcommittee in the time that I've served with you in, in this Congress. And um, I, I want to say that we're going to miss you, but when I think about all of the work that I've been able to do in partnership with the AJC in the last few years as well, in a sense I feel like the partnership is just going to evolve uh, into uh, something equally uh, rewarding and productive. So thank you for everything um, to come as well. Um, I, I want to I say, I, I want to ask you guys a few questions um, about our partnerships with our Gulf allies in particular. And, and I've said many times before, I think the Abraham Accords were fantastic. Uh, the Trump administration was right to pursue them, whatever concerns I or others might have about um, the countries uh, with which Israel is uh, partnering. Uh, the Biden administration was absolutely right to build upon that achievement. Um, but as I think all of you said in different ways, the, the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Bahrainis are doing this in their own interest. and, and I worry sometimes that one of their interests is to um, get us to overlook some of the other actions and policies, uh, uh, some of their actions and policies that are contrary to our interests. Um, right now, I think there's no greater interest we have in the world. The overriding concern America has right now in the world is addressing the, the conflict in Ukraine and countering what Russia, the threat that Russia poses to the entire global order that we helped to build. Um, after the Second World War. Uh, I'm sure you would agree. Uh, I think um, in light of Ukraine's military successes right now, Russia's only hope for victory is to punish the West economically through higher uh, oil and food prices. And here, our Gulf partners have an important role. I, I would say probably their most important role on the world stage is what they do to help stabilize global energy supplies and prices. And I'd argue they have played that role miserably in the last few months. At first, refusing to increase production uh, of energy after the invasion. Then when President Biden made his trip to Saudi Arabia, 
seemingly setting aside other concerns that we had, including over the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Um, the, the Saudis, through OPEC Plus, promised uh, to add 100 um, uh, million, um, uh, 100,000 barrels a day of production. And then on September 5th, what did they do? They cut production by exactly 100,000 uh, barrels. Um, so it seems as if we, you know, you could argue traded our values for oil and got no oil. What, what would maybe, Mr. Exum, if you could maybe share some thoughts about that? Yeah, no, I think, I mean, look, there are a couple things that bedevil us with respect to trying to exercise influence in, in the Middle East. I mean, you know, and I, I'm sorry for going into the details here, there's a difference between foreign military sales and foreign military financing, right? Like, there's the, there's the military aid that we provide that we pay for, right, that we're giving, for example, Israel so that they can uh, acquire uh, advanced U.S.-made weapon systems they wouldn't otherwise be normally able to acquire. And then there's foreign military sales. So, I mean, the challenge we've always had in terms of building security cooperation with our Gulf partners is their money. They can kind of buy what they want to in, in most cases. I mean, we have a, we approve what they can and can't buy, but nonetheless, it's their money. They can decide whether or not they, where they want to make those choices. And that plays out otherwise. I mean, they've got leverage over us. They are, they are independent, powerful actors. I think that one of the things you, you talk about, and this is not the, the scope of this committee, but which is just kind of a words, deeds, mismatch in terms of oil production. I agree that I, I think there may have been uh, precisely that type of words, deeds, mismatch. I'm not sure how much of that is, uh, is due towards, uh, towards malign intent or, or, or an engineering problem that, frankly, um, the, the Saudis may have as well. I, what I personally worry about, Representative Malinowski, is that promises were made to the Biden administration regarding what the Saudis might be able to do as far as increasing oil production, and that didn't necessarily <laughs> line up with what they're actually, actually able to, uh, to do. Well, I'm, I'm concerned that like, we, we allow them to have it both ways, right? that, that the, the message has been after a period of you know toughness on our part, that 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 the relationship, the partnership, is too important for us for it to fail. When I think we should be conveying to them or encouraging them to understand it's too important to them to fail. I mean, as you pointed out, their militaries are not very capable. They need us there, for better or worse. That they're more threatened by Iran, and we are threatened by Iran, but they're even more threatened by Iran. Well, that's right. And and so how do, you, how do you restore that balance where they understand that this is not a one-way street? Yeah, I mean, I actually think Representative Wilson's comment um, makes, uh, you know, is, is relevant here. Um, I actually worry about increasing you know, Gulf ties to, uh, to Russia. To echo something that, that David just said, I actually think most of our partners have, I wouldn't say they've been unhelpful, but I, I will say that they've hedged their bets somewhat. And if I were the administration, I'd have a, a, I think you can honestly say this, you can say, look, Russia is going to be a diminished military and economic power for at least the next decade. Yeah. So make your bets accordingly. Um, I'm not sure if that type of hard message has been delivered or was delivered by the president, but if it hasn't, then I think we should make it. Thank you. I yield. Um, uh, th thank you, Mr. Malinowski. Unless you want me to say a minute more of nice things about it. We don't want to overdo it. All right. Mr. It's, it's already a little uncomfortable, but thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, Representative Perry, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And let me also say that while we, you and I, Ted, have had some disagreements, uh, just a few along the line, maybe over a, an errant amendment or something like that, uh, you have always been respectful and professional, and you've been a friend. We appreciate your service, and we're going to miss you being here. Uh, with that, I thank our experts for being here today. Um, the topic of the hearing, regional security in the Middle East and North Africa, takes on an increased sense of urgency, I think, given the atrocities being perpetrated by the Islamic Republic of Iran. And you probably already know, but many people across the country don't know that at this moment there are folks in Iran protesting in the streets rightfully over the untimely, unnecessary, and unfortunate death of a 20-year-old woman arrested by Iran's morality police. Iran has also accelerated its support for terrorist proxies through cash and steady flow of long-range missiles, UAVs, and other weapons. Earlier this month, Benny Gantz showed up Correction showed a map of 10 military facilities in Syria that are being used by Iran to produce mid- and long-range missiles. Of course, the nuclearization of Iran would change the paradigm in this already tense region. President Raisi has proven himself time and time again to be a dangerous actor. Most recently, in an interview with 60 Minutes, he expressed doubts about the Holocaust 
and rejected Israel's existence while denying his own involvement with Tehran death with the Tehran Death Committee. Unfortunately, the Biden administration ignored requests from Congress, from this Congress, led by Democrats, including uh, those led by members of this committee to deny entry visa to Raisi for this month's United Nations General Assembly session, in turn giving him a platform to address the Assembly today. Given this clear threat, we should be building on, this, on the historic Abraham Accords, and I agree with my colleagues on the other side of the aisle about that for sure. Instead, the administration continues to allow Iran to run roughshod over any semblance of nuclearization safeguards and has pressed for an agreement that would likely actively undermine these very efforts. This may be the understatement of the century, but I think the delisting of the IRGC would significantly affect regional security. Secretary Schenker, in your former role at the State Department, you discussed the key role that sanctions play in stemming the flow of cash to Iran and its terrorist proxy, citing something like $70 billion in recent years denied to Iran. Furthermore, in your written testimony, you mentioned how the Middle East Air Defense Alliance is not a panacea, especially in response to a nuclear Iran. I'm not asking you to predict the future. None of us can do that. I would say, too, though, just because I have a moment here, you know, people say that there would never be a shift in power in Iran, and that, that really can't happen, and, and highlighting protests and putting pressure on them isn't going to make a difference. But it seems to me the last two times the power shift in Iran happened, six months prior to that, people saying the exact same thing, and then in six months the whole thing burned down. But with that having been said, can you elaborate generally about how the easing of sanctions and the subsequent increase in cash flow could escalate insecurity in the region broadly? Thank you, Representative Perry. Um, more money means more mischief. I don't think there's um, any, any denying it. Um, we had seen um, that groups like um, Hezbollah um, had to do a lot more freelancing in terms of, um, of getting involved in the Captagon and other narcotics industries to raise their own funds because Iran um, could not um, provide what they traditionally had provided uh, to this key terrorist proxy. Uh, and so they're very entrepreneurial and they were able to fill the gap, but you saw salaries decrease, et cetera. Um, there will be more and Iran will be, uh, have more largesse, be able to uh, redouble its efforts for programs like the Precision Guided Munitions Project, um, making Hezbollah's dumb rockets into smart uh, missiles, um, further threatening Israel. Um, Rearming, taking this opportunity to rearm and better equip the Houthis uh, in Yemen, which after this ceasefire collapses, which there are signs it, it may, um, will make them more lethal, more dangerous to our allies, our partners, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, um, across the region, um, planting the flag uh, missile factories in Syria, um, basically forcing Israel to go out and mow the lawn um, on a weekly basis, right, hitting targets. Um, I think things get much worse in the region. And I didn't even talk about Iraq, which I think has been um, tragic um, how this uh, um, has, we had a great opportunity with elections in Iraq that we did not capitalize on. Iran is doing extremely well there, about to appoint the next uh, prime minister, maybe get rid of Kadami, et cetera. It's not looking particularly good there. They will do even better um, with uh, uh, flush with, with pallets of cash. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield. To take my manage, magic minute also to, to recognize you and thank you for everything you have done for this committee, but also for the Congress. I want to say that getting to serve alongside you in my role as vice chair of the subcommittee has been a true privilege and certainly one of the highlights of my time in Congress. You've done an extraordinary job leading in this subcommittee and setting the tone for those of us who are dedicated to a strong U.S.-Israel relationship. Uh, and I, I know uh, we will miss you, but I know we have not seen the last of you. So thank you for everything you've done. Uh, Ambassador Shapiro, it's nice to see you here today. We have all, you have all talked about the transformational nature of, of the Abraham Accords and what it has done for the region. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about 
um, what can be done to uh, encourage the Palestinians to get involved in the normalization, to, uh, to improve the situation? How can we use the, how can the Abraham Accords be used to, to uh, make progress in that area? Thank you, uh, Congresswoman, uh, for the question. And it's a very important question because, of course, the uh, Abraham Accords were initially greeted uh, very negatively by the Palestinians as a, a sort of betrayal of what they had uh, accepted as the Arab consensus of a sequence laid out in the Arab Peace Initiative. First, uh, two-state solution and only then normalization. Uh, so they sort of had to get that out of their system. They withdrew their ambassadors from some of those countries. I think some have returned. Uh, but it, uh, it, when you look at the available uh, terrain, or the, you look at the terrain of the region right now, between uh, a Palestinian leadership that is really in a bit of a, a, a succession mode, uh, uh, pending the, uh, the end of President Abbas's uh, rule, uh, not to mention Hamas, uh, the terrorist organization that rules Gaza, and frankly, an Israeli political uh, period of political instability with multiple elections, there's no opportunity uh, for uh, negotiations. There's no opportunity for uh, an Israeli-Palestinian dynamic that will uh, do anything more than uh, try to uh, maintain uh, stability on the ground, which is important, but not move in a, in a bigger direction. In fact, the only potential positive source of energy in the region, in the Israeli-Palestinian region, is the Abraham Accords. Palestinians should be uh, encouraged and invited uh, and uh, urged to participate, to come to the forums where they can take part in the business exchanges, in the education exchanges, in the energy and water projects. For example, the UAE is funding a, a solar energy for desalinated water project between Jordan and Israel. The Palestinians should be part of that and subsequent uh, similar projects. Uh, there are many Palestinians in the business community and the technology sector uh, who uh, are interested in these types of engagements. They need some encouragement. They need some cover uh, from their political leadership, which I don't expect uh, in the near term to show up. But uh, those of us who are partners and sponsors and conveners of these types of gatherings should always make clear that there is a place at that table for the Palestinians. Per, uh, uh, the Biden administration and its partners at the Negev Forum did do that when they laid out the, work, the, uh, the steering committee for the Negev Forum but it's going to need repeated encouragement to get Palestinians to say yes to some of those opportunities. Some members of this committee met with leaders of the business community when we were in Ramallah last year, I think it was, and I, I could certainly see their interest in serving in these, on these different committees or participating in the summits uh, that, that take place in the future. Would you expect objection from their leadership? And if so, what steps could we take to make sure that the, those objections were overcome? I do think initially there will be uh, objections from leadership. Uh, I mentioned the sense of betrayal, the competition in the succession jockeying that's already underway for the day after President Abbas uh, makes that uh, more difficult. But in fact, all of these Arab partners who are now building these relationships with Israel also are, uh, at least they say, uh, committed to achieving a two-state solution. It should be the case that when uh, Israel is at the table with those Arab partners, with the United States still committed to that outcome, uh, and draws Palestinians, whether initially they're uh, unofficial Palestinians and maybe at some later stage, uh, some of those with connections to the Palestinian Authority, I think the conversation begins to change, uh, that Israel can no longer, uh, uh, for its part, uh, ignore the interests of its new Arab partners in trying to make progress in this. Those partners have resources, some of them anyway, uh, that can drive economic improvements on the ground in the Palestinian uh, territories uh, that will undergird uh, some future negotiation. So there is an opportunity here. Uh, it will require uh, a, a sort of pressure and consistency toward Palestinian leaders who are very reluctant to embrace uh, this opportunity or view it as an opportunity, but there, underneath them there are a lot of Palestinians who do see it in those terms. Thank you. Ms. Robinson, you have a lot of detail about uh, your thoughts about how we can move forward in this region. I wonder if you could tell us just a little bit about what can countries that are not part of the Abraham Accords do to prepare themselves, to prepare their publics for normalization with Israel down the road? Thank you uh, very much for that question. Um, and I think that there is um, a certain uh, dialogue already going on in many of these countries as they see the demonstrated effects of the Abraham Accords on increased trade, tourism, travel. 
uh, and just certain of these taboos being uh, broken. I mean, I think many probably members of this uh, subcommittee have been to Dubai, seen the opening of kosher kitchens. AJC has an office open there. There are lots of things happening uh, that are frankly uh, astonishing and visits are occurring. Of course, Morocco, there's always been, I think, a, a warmer uh, relationship, but I think the UAE has been particularly uh, emphatic and vocal and we uh, visited there. I've, I've been to uh, the region multiple times this year to both Israel and uh, the Emirates and elsewhere. And I think the um, senior leaders of the Emirates are emphasizing they want a warm peace and that this year is critical. They believe for their own interests they need to show results. So I think the demonstration effect is what's actually uh, most powerful. And I think the dialogue that is occurring with other Gulf states is important, um, notwithstanding certain sensitivities about public meetings. I think it was very important when Egypt showed up at the Negev summit, uh, signaling a desire to join in that collective process. And that's, I guess, the theme of my remarks have really been, can the region cross the bridge from a highly bilateral approach to more multilateral approaches? And I think the Negev Forum provides an opportunity for a dialogue for the countries to bring their interests together, which is why I also think the project of an OSCE-like organization is so important to put on the table and begin knowing it's a long-term project to work toward it. And I think countries can begin to see ways to address their issues across this menu uh, through such a process. Thank you. Thank, thank you. I have many other questions for our other witnesses, but my time has expired and I yield back. Uh, I <coughs> Uh, I thank the Vice Chair. Um, thank you for your participation. Thank you for the kind words. And I yield five minutes to Mr. Mast. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I also I want to thank you for your service uh, as well, a fellow Floridian. And, and I absolutely I wish you the best in your future endeavors. I, I really do. Um, I have some questioning for Mr. Schenker. Uh, if you don't mind, I want to talk a little bit about Israel and Lebanon, uh, something a little bit different than what we've been speaking about so far. And you look at some of the numbers to date, uh, somewhere around two and a half billion dollars with a B in security assistance to the Lebanese armed forces since, you know, 2006 is the number that I had in front of me. So part of the reason uh, for that for that assistance is to serve as a counter to Hezbollah. Uh, who we know, you know, absolute terror in the region, uh, but they still operate quite freely uh, on the, the southern Lebanon area along Israel's northern border and in violation of the United Nations Security Council's resolutions. Um, the Hezbollah leadership, they're constantly threatening Israel. Again, this is a provocative. We all know this. Uh, and we could foresee in the future uh, a, a conflict, uh, certainly between Israel and Hezbollah in Lebanese territory uh, could be very justifiable there. So what I want to understand is, given the dollars that we've put into the Lebanese armed forces, the military, the rifles, the bullets, the ordnance, the everything there, in your opinion, how can we ensure that U.S. assistance to Lebanon, those bombs and bullets that, that we participated in, in uh, purchasing over there, uh, are not used against our ally Israel. And to go beyond that, what speculation would you give about why that assistance has been given, but the follow through of uh, extracting Hezbollah from that border there has not been able to take place? Uh, thank you for the question, Representative Mast. Um, Listen, uh, the money for, for Lebanon, I, I think I want to uh, sort of point out uh, what I think is a misconception. I, I don't think the LAF was ever conceived as a counterweight to Hezbollah. Um, back when I was in the Pentagon during the Bush administration, um, we started giving money to the LAF after the Lebanese people rose up and, and ended the Syrian occupation, that there needed to be some s source of uh, public security. Um, and domestic counterterrorism against Sunni Muslim terrorist groups. Um, there was never any um, uh, conception or 
um, the misconception that, uh, that Hezbollah, that uh, the LAF, the Lebanese Armed Forces, would take on Hezbollah. Um, and they have done a, a decent job at domestic counterterrorism, maintaining public order. This is a state that is essentially collapsing. Um, it is the least bad option, as I see it. Um, I think that uh, they, they are very capable on certain level, um, but they will never stand up to Hezbollah on the last time that the LAF um, took on a mission that had uh, sectarian um, uh, sort of elements to it. Um, um, the army split along sectarian lines at the very beginning of the Lebanese Civil War. Um, so I, I would anticipate uh, this is something they will not do. But meanwhile, the LAF is key in, um, in the role it should be playing in the South in facilitating uh, UNIFIL um, uh, looking, searching for um, illegal weapons um, uh, in South Lebanon. And in fact, according to um, reports, the LAF is actually playing a role in obstructing uh, the role of, of UNIFIL there. Um, and this is incredibly problematic, and it's not enough to just call them out. Um, I think we have to uh, have a real um, um, heart to heart with the, with the LAF about um, what we expect of them. Um, uh, because um, right now, uh, while better than nothing, uh, it is certainly uh, uh, problematic. You know the old saying, uh, six of one, half a dozen of another. And it, and it sounds a little bit like that. Uh, and I, I think I extracted from your answer, they have capabilities. They don't necessarily have the will because of uh, the, the lines that some of their uh, you know, nationals find themselves drawing, um, which is to be expected. Uh, let me ask something uh, in this respect that do you think our assistance uh, has found its way to supporting Hezbollah? Well, thanks for that question. I, I think um, certainly I'm not up to, on the latest um, sort of classified stuff of, uh, of um, uh, whether our FMF um, has uh, had any leakage, but historically uh, the Lebanese Armed Forces has done um, a very good job at controlling, protecting um, U.S. weapons. Um, of course, the Defense Attaché's office goes around and looks at serial numbers, and um, there is no leakage. I mean, the sad thing, uh, as I see it, is um, Hezbollah just doesn't need this equipment. They have top-shelf equipment provided by Iran, um, including um, U.S. origin weapons. Um, they don't need what the LAF has. Um, but uh, there hasn't been any leakage. And um, I would hope, as with 2006 and 2007, uh, the last time that Israel and, and Hezbollah went at it in a serious way, that the LAF remained um, in the barracks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mast. I uh, now yield five minutes to Mr. Sherman. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I'd like to start by uh, praising you for your, I believe, decades of uh, being the chief Democrat on this subcommittee. Um, I uh, know you're moving on to the American Jewish Committee where uh, we will continue to work together and you will continue to have uh, a, uh, a strong voice uh, on these issues and uh, I think uh, accomplish uh, many good things in the future. Um, uh, there's a lot of focus on the uh, possibility of a renewed uh, deal with Iran. Um, can any of you comment on what would be the level of economic benefit the Iranians would get? Uh, we've had a lot of discussion of what the world would get as far as backing them off from the brink of a nuclear weapon right now, uh, but what's in it for the Iranians? And, and, and can you quantify, uh, I'll add a little bit to the question, and that is there's discussion of varying amounts of billions of dollars being unfrozen. It's my understanding that any of this money frozen in China or South Korea could be used to purchase goods in China or South Korea. Um, so when you say it's unfrozen, how frozen is it? 
uh, Mr. Sherman, I'll take the first shot, but our colleagues okay. obviously should, should add. I, I don't have a number uh, to provide. It's significant. Uh, nobody, I think, should pretend otherwise between unfrozen assets, between the ability to sell oil unfettered, between mm -hmm. the uh, end of enforcement of various multilateral sanctions, while obviously most U.S. sanctions will remain in place. Uh, there's no question uh, that Iran will uh, derive uh, significant economic benefit uh, from. Is, is uh, there anyone with any uh, any specifics as to unfrozen assets, or anyone here with expertise on uh, uh, how much? I mean, we we've, we've been told they can go from one million barrels a day to two million barrels a day, but perhaps somebody can put some gloss on that. Yeah, and the, uh, I, I don't have the specific specifics for you. I mean, we, we saw uh, certain figures about the uh, release of uh, seven billion, I believe, and, and funds from South Korea uh, mm -hmm. that would be freed up. Um, um, we know that they're smuggling already about a billion, uh, uh, bar um, a million barrels and, a day. And I would, I would add that what they can't export, they can burn to create electricity and mine crypto. So uh, you may think they're not exporting it, but uh, uh, there's more ways to export oil than exporting oil. Um, Abrahamic Accords, obviously very important. What countries in the Middle East, North Africa area could we see uh, 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 recognizing Israel and establishing um, uh, diplomatic relations? Any good things in the future? Anybody close? Nobody's uh, uh, able to make those predictions precisely. I think the Saudis have made pretty clear uh, that this is a trajectory they are on. Uh, the timing is hard to say. The, the overflight decision during President mm -hmm. Biden's visit is a, is a signal. Statements made by the Crown Prince about his future intentions or about his overall approach to Israel, I think, lean in that direction. Uh, but uh, that timing is not clear. I do think others in the Gulf, particularly Oman and Qatar, are candidates. Uh, they already have their own uh, relationships with Israel fairly openly conducted, even if not formally normalized. Uh, Mauritania uh, in, uh, in North Africa is a, another country that is, I think, uh, had actual discussions uh, with Israeli and perhaps with American officials uh, around that. So these are all candidates. Uh, in fact, there are probably countries outside the region as well, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Bangladesh, uh, perhaps Niger, uh, other Muslim-majority countries that do not yet have normalized relations with Israel uh, that are putting out feelers. Uh, the precise timing of when those happen, uh, what the package is, if there's a U.S. role, as there was in several of the original uh, Abraham Accord countries, uh, those are all going to be factors in timing. I'll just also add, we've gotten this wrong before. I mean, for, for decades we used to say, well, we don't know who the first Arab country is going to be to recognize Israel, but we know that Lebanon's going to be the second, right? Because it's <laughs> got this, you know, big Christian population, and obviously we couldn't have been more wrong there, right? Um, I think I would be surprised if, uh, if Saudi Arabia normalized relations with Israel under this king. Um, after this king recedes from the, uh, from the throne, you know, who so knows? So you don't think this king has fully receded, even though we look at MBS as if he's the de facto ruler? Yeah, I, look, I, I haven't uh, been in an audience with the king for, uh, for several years, but I can just say that when uh, greeting him and meeting him with uh, senior officials during the Obama administration, I think he was much more present than, uh, than was often rumored. Um, and I think he does have a strong policy preference on this. But I, I agree with, uh, with what Ambassador Shapiro said. I, I do think that uh, normalization is coming. Um, on what timeline is really the uh, is really the, the key question, and I think Saudi Arabia and that then any goes of back to the Iranian nuclear program, which is driving some of the relationship between Saudi Arabia and Israel. And with that, I yield back. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Representative Sherman. Uh, Representative Jackson, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Wilson. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I uh, haven't had the pleasure of getting to know you as well as some of the members here, being a freshman congressman. But I too will tell you, uh, I appreciate your leadership on the uh, on the committee, and uh, I hope we have the opportunity to work in the future, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all of our uh, witnesses for being here today. Uh, I just returned from a CODEL to the Middle East, where I spoke at length about regional security and our cooperation with our partners in the region, our partners in the region, to include the uh, Prime Minister and the opposition. We're here discussing obstacles to our cooperation. However, the biggest obstacle I heard about while I was in Israel was the ongoing efforts to revive the Iran nuclear deal. Those, uh, those concerns were heard loud and clear by our CODEL, uh, by our bipartisan CODEL from everyone we talked to. Uh, Mr. Shapiro, <clears throat> 
ambassador, sorry. Um, you served as the U.S. ambassador to Israel under President Obama, and you were part of the Biden administration's team, uh, team's ongoing negotiations for the new Ar Iran deal until you resigned earlier this year. Is that correct, sir? Uh, that's correct. Thank you. Um, it was reported that Richard Nephew left his post on the, team, on the team as Deputy Special Envoy for Iran because of his policy disagreements with Robert Malley and the direction the team was going. Is that true as well? I can't speak to anybody else's decisions, uh, Congressman. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to ask you, sir, uh, did, you, did your resignation have anything to do at all with policy disagreements that you had with Robert Malley? It did not, sir. Uh, I had uh, agreed to uh, serve as an advisor and consultant uh, regarding uh, the discussions with Israel over the Iran uh, nuclear discussions uh, for a period of six months. At the conclusion of that six months, actually extended it slightly. Uh, I was preparing to begin a new role, which I'm <coughs> excuse me, currently in at the Atlantic Council. Uh, uh, disagreements had nothing to do, and there were no disagreements uh, with why I uh, left, uh, left the U.S. government at that point. Thank you, sir. Uh uh, the, continuing with Mr. Shapiro here, sir, Ambassador, uh, I'm going to ask a few questions here in the interest of time, if you could just give me a yes or no, but do you believe that the Biden administration should be offering to grant the Iranian regime billions of dollars in sanction relief? Uh, it's hard, yes or no question, uh, Congressman. I believe the Biden administration faces a very difficult dilemma, uh, whether to restore a nuclear agreement that would buy a certain amount of time, not that much, and uh, not as much as the previous agreement, and keep Iran at some distance from a breakout capability at the cost of very significant sanctions relief, which we know Iran will use for nefarious purposes, or uh, the current situation where Iran is effectively already a nuclear threshold state. Uh, and without the agreement, that will be the new reality we will, go for, we will have to deal with going forward. That's a very tough situation, and uh, the decision uh, is between two very bad options. Yes, I agree. And, and I was just, you know, just before your resignation earlier this year, the White House spokes, uh, spokesperson, Jen Psaki, warned that if a deal wasn't reached in the coming weeks, uh, Iran's uh, ongoing nuclear advances were going to make it impossible for us to return to the JCPOA. Now, that deadline passed, and your then boss, uh, Iran uh, envoy Bob Malley, has kept negotiating. And so I kind of, I'd like to know, did you or do you agree with that approach? Uh, I, first of all, didn't resign. I want to make clear that I ended a consultancy and, and moved on to other roles. But uh, I believe that the uh, Biden administration has tried to keep alive this possibility of a restoration of the deal. Uh, I'm not involved in any of the current discussions or the internal consultation, so I don't know information that would be relevant to the decision about when to decide negotiations can no longer go forward. Uh, at this point, they appear to be quite stalled, and perhaps uh, it's not even clear they will re resume at all. Uh, but uh, again, based on that terrible dilemma uh, of whether to live with Iran as a nuclear threshold state or whether to buy a limited amount of time uh, at the cost of uh, significant sanctions relief, uh, the Biden administration so far uh, has decided to at least keep that door open. And I think that's a plausible decision uh, that reasonable people can disagree on. Right. Well, uh, you know, also, and you've already hit on this a little bit, but at the time of your, you know, when you left, not your resignation, but when you left, uh, Mali was also offering to lift sanctions uh, on the IRGC. Do you agree with that as a, poss as a possible negotiating? Well, what I know is that President Biden has removed from the table the op the option of uh, lifting or removing the IRGC from the foreign terrorist organization uh, list. And considering uh, the IRGC's uh, well-documented uh, sponsorship of numerous terrorist organizations and conducting its own terrorist operations around the region, uh, I strongly agree with that decision. Thank you. And you've already mentioned this as well, so I'll just rephrase this. But I, I'm, I'm concerned about this as well because I think that this is only slowing things down very temporarily. I think that the upwards of 75 to $100 billion that the Iranians are going to get is going to be used uh, to sponsor terrorism around the world uh, against us and our allies. And so uh, I, have a, I have a lot of issues with this moving forward. I, I think there's very little gain from this, and there's a lot to lose from this. But uh, I appreciate your uh, input, sir. And uh, I, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Representative Jackson. Uh, Representative Connolly, I believe you are next. I yield to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and let me uh, also add my voice. Uh, professionally, we're going to miss you in the Congress and certainly on this committee and subcommittee, and I'm going to miss you as a friend. Uh, I wish you well in your new endeavor, and I know I'll be working with you in that capacity, but your voice and your, your uh, decency uh, is going to really be missed in the halls of Congress. So thank you for all you've done in your tenure. 
Uh, Ambassador Shapiro, it seems to me that when we're in diplomacy, we're dealing with the art of the possible. We try to push the envelope um, and, uh, and, and get the best results we can. Is, is that a fair way of describing the diplomatic effort? That's a very fair way of describing it, and particularly in the Middle East, I think <clears throat> all of my colleagues here who have uh, worked in uh, that arena for many years understand that frequently uh, the possible is uh, the best that one can achieve, and we're often, as I was alluding to a moment ago, choosing between rather unappealing options. Sometimes the least bad uh, of those options yeah. is the best that one can shoot for. So I can remember a number of my colleagues who were critics of the JCPOA making all kinds of predictions about uh, we were being led by the nose, uh, Iran would uh, just use it as a cloak to in fact accelerate their nuclear program, they would never comply, they would cheat and lie, uh, and then manipulate the environment to their advantage. But in fact, we had testimony after the JCPOA went into effect, both from our own State Department and from the IAEA, that, it, that Iran complied. It complied, for example, with the metrics we set on centrifuges, enriched uranium, the shipment of excess enriched uranium, uh, the plugging of the plutonium production reactor, uh, allowing inspections. That in fact, there was no pattern of cheating or lying. They complied. Is that a fair statement? That is, uh, at the time, uh, from the time that the uh, JCPOA was signed until uh, President Trump withdrew from the deal, uh, I don't believe there was any significant uh, dispute uh, between Israel and the United States and the IEA and, and others monitoring it that Iran was uh, upholding its obligations under the JCPOA. And, and remember, uh, you know, please confirm, but the goal both for us and the Israeli government was to make sure that we did not have a nuclear state, Iran, with, equipped with nuclear weapons. Is that correct? That, that is correct. And the JCPOA bought a so, certain amount and a not an insignificant amount of time uh, to ensure that that would not be the case. So the United States under President Trump walks away for its own, from its own agreement. And we renounce that agreement. And what happens, well, Iran no longer complies and, in fact, does accelerate its nuclear program, absent an agreement led by the United States. And, uh, and by the way, ups its malign behavior in the region while it's at it. Is that a fair statement? Uh, definitely. Once uh, the United States was no longer abiding by the agreement, Iran began to violate its commitments under the agreement. That has led to the current situation where it has enriched a significant amount of uranium far beyond the limits the JCPA permits and at far higher levels than the JCPA permits to the point where they currently possess enough uranium. If they were to en enrich to weapons grade, they could probably produce five or six weapons. They have not, that we know of, right. made a decision to weaponize, but, so there's a certain amount of time but built Mr. in. Ambassador, but I want to just underscore, all of that happened after the United States renounced its own agreement, the JCPA, which Iran was complying with. That's correct. So those who, you know, decry the prospect of a nuclear Iran, but who actually supported President Trump's renunciation of an agreement that in fact was being complied with and working, and unwittingly perhaps, or, you know, have actually helped produce the result they said they didn't want and I guess I want to give you an opportunity. If we're not going to revive this agreement in some fashion, what are our options? It seems to me the only option, if, if your goal is we will never accept the nuclear Iran, then you're left to a military kinetic option, which to me seems catastrophic if we, if we were to go down that road. But I'd like you to have the final word on that, given your experience and perspective. Well, President Biden has committed, and he said it again during his visit to the region, that he will never permit Iran to have a nuclear weapon. Uh, he believes uh, that uh, restoring this agreement, even though it buys less time than it would it did originally, uh, is still the best way to buy the most time to prevent that. Uh, 
Of course, that may not be possible, and it may not be possible uh, because the Iranians uh, won't uh, live up to their, uh, the, what the agreement required, or they'll make impossible demands for U.S. guarantees or for ending IEA safeguards investigations. So we do need to be prepared for the possibility that there is no deal. Uh, uh, obviously, when one says they will never allow Iran to have a nuclear weapon, uh, military capabilities, whether the U.S. or, or whether Israel's, uh, become relevant to that discussion, before we get to that point, I think we will need to shift to a policy of deterrence which is really quite different uh, and something we've never really quite uh, used in this region. Uh, we've used policies of prevention of one kind or another, whether diplomatic or, or, or uh, 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 sort of obstructing uh, the, the progress of the program in various ways. Uh, but if they are at that point of uh, threshold capability, and they really are today, and their deal is essentially off the table by our choice or by theirs, uh, we are shifting into a policy of deterrence to ensure that they don't weaponize, uh, but also there must be uh, a military option uh, available to fulfill the requirement that they never have a nuclear weapon. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. My time has expired. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Connolly. Uh, I appreciate the kind words. And with that, I will yield to Mr. Burchett. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Add me to that list of um, others that are singing your praises, I guess. Um, I just wanted to, I'm just glad that you will continue to be a thorn in our side in your newest occupation. And I consider you a friend, brother. So thank you. And I'm sorry I will not make your going away party tonight. I will be adding a level of mediocrity to the congressional football team and my lackluster play. So you'll possibly be able to visit me in the emergency room following the game. So it's a pleasure, sir. You've been a real good friend and I look forward to working with you. Um, I'm not sure who should answer this best, but just jump in. Uh, I wonder how has Russia and China increased their security cooperation in the region? And, I'm, and if they have, I wonder how we would blunt this or slow it down. <clears throat> well, I, guess, well I, I don't know if you want me to go first. Go um, ahead, brother. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Representative Burchett. Um, listen, I think that um, China has certain uh, advantages in the region over the United States. Um, in particular, their uh, foreign policy is value less. You know, there's, uh, they don't care if you kill dissidents or make women wear hijab or uh, have dungeons, et cetera. Um, and this is uh, appealing for many states. Plus, um, the United States has a, a very long procurement process um, for FMF and, and FMS, um, congressional approvals, that sort of thing. Uh, and so uh, these are shorter timelines, and there are just some things that we don't sell. Um, you know, our best Arab ally, Jordan, had to go out at one point and buy <coughs> Chinese drones because of MCTR issues that we have that we would not we would not sell them to them, and so. Uh, there are certain things, and, and, uh, and I would mention Saudi Arabia, where the Wall Street Journal reported that China and, and, and Saudi are jointly building a ballistic missile factory in the kingdom. Um, because obviously we won't sell them that, but this is something they see as important to their defense facing off against Iran in the region. And so um, they are making some headway, but the packages are, uh, I think we still remain uh, the partner of choice. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, this is uh, an issue. And to blunt that, um, we have to think, I think, more creatively about how we, we sell weapons and what weapons we sell to what partners. Um, because we can't just say, like we have been saying with Huawei, et cetera, and 5G, uh, don't do that. Um, we have to say, don't do that, here's an alternative. Uh, and offer them that, even if it is um, uh, you know, a higher price that we have to work to get these things down to be reasonable. We can't just, you know, finger wag. Uh, and so th there are, th they are making some headway in the region, including in the UAE. <laughs> you read about the port. Um, you know, uh, other countries in the region are looking at uh, Chinese ports. This is not, um, not a great thing because, of course, even if they say they are commercial, there is no such thing as a private corporation in the PRC. 
Thank you very much. I would like to just add a few points. Um, and I'd like to broaden a bit. I know your question is specifically about the security competition, but of course China's stake in the region is huge. It relies for almost half of its oil. Uh, it's become the top trade and investment partner, and it is a ready and eager supplier of all kinds of commodities. But the drones, are, I think, are a particularly attractive um, item right now. And the fact that the uh, Chinese are also, as one um, uh, senior official put it to me, they're very quick to answer our calls. So I think this kind of gets to demonstration of ongoing U.S. interest in the region and willingness to be a steady partner. We, for years, used this partner of choice uh, rhetoric, but I think there's deep concern in the region about whether we have staying power and talk about us uh, pivoting away because precisely we're more concerned with China and Russia, to which I argue and many others argue the a primary battleground for this competition is in the Middle East, so we need to stay engaged. The complex process of which Congress is a critical partner of uh, deciding which arms and to which partners uh, I think can uh, be uh, examined, but I think it's very important to have agreements, clear agreements and enforceable agreements uh, about end use for these technologies. As Andrew had said earlier, we do not want to give uh, uh, technology a way that is used to conduct war in another country. It should be, in my view, primarily for the defense, agreed defensive purposes. And I think that's actually a very important part of the values uh, the, of the country. So we have a serious competition with China and Russia. Uh, I do think we have advantages in the quality and types of material by and large, but I believe it is a fact the region is diversifying. Thank you. I, I will say, though, that, I mean, in, in, in all that is also the answer to your question, which is what, you know, how you counter that, which is that there's going to be a trade-off that these countries are going to have. You can accept Chinese, uh, you know, engineers on your air bases. You can bring in Chinese technology, but like, we're not going to keep F-16s on a runway if that's the case, right? And that, there just needs to be a hard conversation there. Just, we didn't mention Russia. Before uh, the war in Ukraine, I was extremely concerned about creeping Russian influence, less so in the Gulf, certainly across North Africa and, and the Levant. Um, that's got to be less of a concern now, and I think it's just a, you just have a blunt conversation with our partners in the region. We talked about this a little bit earlier. You just say, look, you know, for the next decade at least, these guys are a diminished power, militarily, economically. Look what's going on in Ukraine. These, this is the gang that can't shoot straight. You don't want to throw your lot in with these guys. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back no time to you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Representative Burchett, and uh, be careful tonight. Uh, next, I will yield five minutes to the founding co-chair of the Abraham Accords Caucus, uh, and a great member of the subcommittee, Representative Schneider. Uh, thank you, um, Chairman Deutsch. And I'm going to use that first magic minute to reflect on more than a decade of our friendship. I remember first meeting you. I remember joining you uh, on the Middle East North Africa Committee. You have been an extraordinary friend and a mentor. Your leadership, your outstanding leadership, has been demonstrated with your vision, passion, and wisdom, and we are going to sorely miss you. I wish you luck in your next endeavor. So thank you very much. Uh, and I want to thank the witnesses, both for your time here, but also the work you're doing. As uh, the chairman mentioned, mentioned, I was pleased to found the uh, Abraham Accords Caucus with my colleague Ann Wagner from this committee, uh, Kathy McMorris Rogers, and, and David Trone. It is bipartisan. It is bicameral. I think that's a reflection of the significance and importance we recognize within Congress uh, of, of these accords, both for its prospects to bring prosperity and, and, and peace into the region, but also uh, the security that it, it provides. Uh, you can't have one uh, without the other, obviously. So um, I thank you for that. And uh, along those lines, in addition to the accords, and um, uh, Ms. Uh, Robinson, you mentioned this, the, the DEFEND Act that was introduced by the co-chairs of, of the accords, as well as our, our, our colleagues, um, Don Bacon and Jimmy Panetta, is critical by promoting that both the, the collaboration but also the coordination of, of defense uh, within the region. I was hoping you could expand a little bit. I was intrigued by your comparison to the OSCE as perhaps an analog to what we can achieve uh, in the region. Thank you very much. And yes, I, I did mention and in my testimony the DEFEND Act of which you are a uh, co-sponsor. And I would like to say I think that provides a useful um, opportunity 
for what I hope would be a public study that would out lay out the options and the requirements for implementing this architecture. I think there are a lot of technical uh, issues, but it would stand as an example to countries of what their benefit could be from joining in to such an architecture. Um, I laid that out, the, the Middle East um, air and defense system. I think it's better to call it that than alliance because I think there is still wariness about using the word alliance. Uh, but it's an effort that directly and immediately would protect countries from these increasingly precise uh, drones, missiles, and uh, ballistic and cruise missiles. I, I think that that would be a good near-term objective, but as I said, I think that kind of endeavor were countries to uh, uh, embark upon that, it would help pave the way to a more comprehensive organizational effort. The same way I see the Negev Forum as a process whereby countries can come in and engage, as I understand it, the U.S. at least, wants this to be an open forum where not just the signatories can attend and that would include issues like the Palestinian issues. So I think the more of these efforts are ongoing, you could see building sequentially to an actual formal organization uh, such as the OSCE. And I think that that is a very feasible uh, um, uh, objective, whereas I don't think a NATO type organization is a feasible objective, and it would have the benefit of really enshrining what you see happening now. Uh, the Arab League only includes Arab countries, increasingly, Turkey, uh, Iran, Israel, they're active uh, members of the region. Right. And that's, and, I think, and, the and big sorry, break. I just want to be, uh, Thank you. I'm watching the clock because I, I think you touched on something really important. Um, one of the significant, significant aspects of the Abraham Accords to me is that they're multilateral. But also in the Negev uh, uh, summit demonstrated this, they're multifaceted. It's the normalization of relations, it is economic, technological security, so many uh, different facets to it. And if I can turn to uh, you, Ambassador Shapiro, having just returned from visiting the, the countries, maybe you can expand on how building out or expanding on the facets uh, can strengthen the ties and also make sure that it's got the support of the people in the various cu countries. I think what the Negev uh, Forum holds the possibility of, and we're trying to help it uh, support that uh, through our work at the Atlantic Council, uh, is precisely to demonstrate to the citizens of these countries that there are benefits that they derive in their lives, in their education, in their business, in their environment, in their agriculture, uh, from uh, these normalization agreements. And, and it does hold the potential as well to build a multilateral architecture that goes well beyond uh, the moment of normalization. Normalization is an event. It happens, uh, and then it's over. Uh, then it's time to build relationships. Obviously, the bilateral relationships are progressing. The, US, the UAE and Israel have an FTA now. Uh, Israel and Bahrain, and Israel and Morocco have defense uh, uh, agreements. There's a lot of bilateral tourism going back and forth. But uh, it will take longer to build that multilateral architecture where the, each layer and each domain reinforce the other, uh, where the civil societies and the citizens are feeling the benefits, where the governments, therefore, are feeling more support for taking those next steps, where there's more, <clears throat> therefore, justification for doing more open uh, defense and security cooperation. Uh, all of these layer on top of each other, and whether it's an OSCE-style agreement uh, organization or an ASEAN-style organization, I think that really needs to be the goal. It's well beyond the moment when embassies open in each other's countries. It's when you actually build a regional architecture where everybody contributes and everybody benefits. Uh, thank you, and, and I'm, I'm out of time, but if I can have two seconds more, I, I would say we, we focused here on the Abraham Accords and the opportunities they provide. I'm often asked what keeps me awake at night when I think about the Middle East, of course it's Iran, the threat of a nuclear Iran, the threat of Iran's ballistic missiles, its support for terrorists and, and uh, uh, rogue states in the region. But it's the Abraham Accords that give me the confidence that um, uh, we can work to find a way to thwart Iran's ambitions and work with our allies in the region to make sure first Iran never gets a, a nuclear weapon, but also that Iran's influence is, is countered and our interests are protected. With that, I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Schneider. All right, uh, Mr. Allred, I think, is on his way. But uh, I will go ahead and yield myself some time. I, I, wanted, <clears throat> excuse me, I wanted to follow up on both the challenges of Iran and the opportunities of the Abraham Accords. Um, on Iran, Mr. Schenker, I, I think you, um, 
and, and Ambassador Shapiro, you touched on this also, but you, you, there's, you put some, some, uh, some real meat on, on the bones of this argument, Mr. Shanker, which is if we're going to consider entering an agreement, se separate and apart from the history of the JCPOA, if we're going to enter an agreement now, uh, what will it mean in the short term for Iran? And you suggested more money for precision-guided missiles, rearming Houthis, um, missile factories in Syria. You talked about the concerns that are in, uh, about Iran's activities in Iraq. Can, can you take that one step further? What, because I, I just think, to be fair about this, it, this is not a question of we have a deal or we have nothing. We have a deal, and I'm going to get to the what happens if there is no deal. But, but under a, under a deal with access to all of those funds, what does it actually look like in the region in six months or a year? How different is it from what we see today? That's a good question. Um, listen, I think to start off with, there, Iran is just not deterred. Right, uh, they are uh, doing all their activities. There is very little. Uh, pushback um, from us, right? Uh, Israel is uh, very active in pushing back, but we are not. I think they see uh, a, a freer hand uh, because after all, if you sign an agreement um, with Iran, um, the next day we are not gonna go out there and start whacking um, Iranian fast boats that are harassing US vessels in the Straits of Hormuz. Right? We're not gonna attack Iran the day after we sign uh, an agreement, and yet there is no way to deter Iran other than perhaps through periodically defending ourselves or being proactive in defending ourselves and working with our partners to defend them. It's all tools of national power, but all tools do not just include the Department of Treasury. Right? It periodically includes DOD. Um, and so I, I think that they, uh, and I, uh, Sadly, if you want to look back, I think there wasn't the deterrence aspect. The JCPOA may have worked, um, but um, Iran was in another way uh, emboldened because they weren't going to be held to account for their other behavior. And I think it makes it harder in many ways um, to do that. And I think every administration would say they can walk and chew gum, but it's, it's difficult. Right. So, <clears throat> so the, um, there, are, there are those who argue that um, if we look at Iran's behavior under the JCPOA, where they, where they effectively complied with the terms of the JCPOA, that they're likely to do the same here. You hear that argument both from supporters of the JCPOA, JCPOA and critics who would suggest that there's every reason to comply in the near term because uh, in a few years, the restrictions all fall by the wayside. Either way, what is it uh, what can, again, just be a little more specific, what can Iran, what is it likely Iran would do with the dramatically increased resources available to them um, once the assets are unfrozen and, and they re-engage in the, the uh, oil market? I believe the first things that you're gonna see are um, Iraq um, further uh, digging in with uh, its, its own sort of relatively new Hashid militias. Um, strengthening these organizations, uh, grabbing more of the state um, in Iraq. Um, but then whether we see, uh, as I said before, um, the uh, precision guided munitions upgrading um, Hezbollah, better paying their new recruits who are underpaid for their work in Syria, et cetera. Um, you'll, ha you'll have organizations that have improved morale, um, which until now, in the past couple of years, have been very tough with the maximum pressure campaign. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, Ambassador Shapiro, uh, you also talked about deterrence so they don't weaponize. Um, what, and again, I ask this as a start, what, what, what does that look like? There's going to have to be a plan to deal with the potential uh, weaponized, or nuclear weaponized Iran, whether we start today, given the 60% enriched uranium, or, 
or whether we look ahead to the end of a JCPOA when the restrictions under the JCPOA no longer apply. What does that deterrence look like? That's a very difficult uh, question, uh, and I certainly don't feel like You're I have very a very smart witness. Yeah, I don't feel like I have a, a perfect answer to it. It's among the reasons uh, the administration, uh, looking at the difficult options, the bad options, frankly, uh, before it keeps coming back to trying not to declare these talks dead, keeps coming, coming back to uh, trying to keep alive, buying a bit more time uh, as restoring the deal, because the answer is so poor. Uh, now, uh, obviously, some degree of U.S. presence in the region, some degree of U.S. kinetic activity, including against non-nuclear threats. I agree with David Schenker uh, that there are moments when it is appropriate and necessary for the Iranians to feel the sting of an American reaction, not just Israeli strikes uh, in various forms, uh, when they violate certain norms, even in the non-nuclear space. That may be an element of deterrence even on the, on the nuclear side. Uh, but certainly having uh, a military capability, uh, it, we have had one uh, that was put in place during the years I was in government, but probably I don't know whether it has evolved to keep up with the further hardening and the further diver, uh, uh, distrib uh, dis uh, distribution of the Iranian program uh, is going to be part of that. And coordinating between us and the Israelis about who would uh, use what capabilities and under what circumstances, and making sure the Iranians are aware that if they cross certain thresholds of weaponization, uh, that could be the, those could be the triggers. That's part of the deterrent strategy. Right. But here, here's what I'm going to do, Mr. Allred. I'm going to finish asking a couple, uh, one more question about uh, Iran, and then we're going to go to you. And then it's my, I'm the chair, so I'm going to ask some questions about the opportunities ahead. So, uh, Ambassador Shapiro. I appreciate the thoughtful answer, but hope, hoping that we might get back into the deal uh, so that we don't, it puts off the time when we have to determine what the right answer is here, uh, ignores, it seems to me, ignores the fact that Iran has, has moved ahead to this point where they're enriching to 60% which the IAEA made clear only when the Director General was here that only countries who want nuclear weapons pursue, uh, enrich to 60%. And there, it's not clear what the result, result will be. If, if there were no discussions, and I, I've just been asking this question for, um, for some time now, so I'm gonna ask you. If, there, if the, there were no such thing as a JCPOA and Iran enriched, started enriching, and then enriched beyond three and a half, and beyond, and beyond, and now they're at 60 percent, and they got this close to having weapons grade enrichment. If, in the absence of a JCPOA, what would the right response be? And right now, there is no JCPOA, so why aren't we talking about that response? Uh, indeed, I think at the time Iran began enriching to 60 percent, uh, there may have been a missed opportunity uh, to uh, provide a, a, a response, whether it would be a toughening of certain sanctions, whether it would be a condemnation uh, in uh, various international forums like the IEA uh, Board of Governors. Uh, and uh, Iran may have felt at that time that they got away with it. And it may have been that the Biden administration was trying to keep the atmosphere of the talks at that time uh, positive enough that they would be able to uh, advance the deal. I do think that may have been a missed opportunity. Um, uh, look, it, it, it should be clear uh, to Iran, and it should be a consensus position of the international community uh, that these steps uh, are unacceptable. Uh, there should be clear that they will continue to pay a higher price uh, economically, uh, and it, it would be perfectly reasonable to toughen sanctions while uh, negotiating uh, for them having crossed those lines. Uh, and it is perfectly reasonable uh, to ensure that uh, the Iran understands and others in the international community understands that, uh, that U.S. military options are available and on the table, and to signal that uh, by their use in other appropriate circumstances. 
Uh, those are all steps that I think could be uh, part of trying to help uh, uh, Iran and others understand uh, that they're already into this unacceptable danger zone. Uh, to do those while also negotiating is very tricky and very complicated. I don't uh, envy uh, those who have to make that uh, balancing, uh, try to uphold that balancing act. Uh, but those are steps that I think could have and still could be uh, used effectively. Uh, last word on, for me on this, and I appreciate that, is that we, in 2015, uh, we had to remind everyone that there is no inherent, that there, there's no inherent right that a country has to enrich uranium. In fact, the UAE wanted to have nuclear power. They signed this one, two, three agreement as the gold standard. No enrichment in their country. They, were, they could have their, and, and that went by the wayside. And then we just, it, it became almost accepted that, well, Iran has the right to enrich uranium. They don't. Now we're at the point where, as you point out, They've enriched to 60 percent, and we, we have to go back to remind people how dangerous it is and how, frankly, outrageous it is that a country with their avowed aims has enriched this uh, uranium this close to weapons grade without seemingly any repercussions. Um, I'm now going to yield five minutes to Mr. Allred before finishing with Mr. Exum and Ms. Robinson. Uh, and uh, I appreciate it, Mr. Already recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, if this is your last hearing, I'll just take the opportunity to say that you know it's been an honor to serve with you. You'll certainly be missed. I'll, I'll still be bothering you, though. So, and I'm glad to see Dr. Exum here, uh, my friend and former constituent. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to, to talk to you all about um, a new, or what we could consider to be a Middle Eastern security architecture uh, for the United States. You know, we have taken a different approach than we have in other areas where, for example, NATO's Article 5 commitments or in Asia, our bilateral structure that we have there in terms of you know, building out uh, a security structure. But we have enormous commitments to security in the Middle East. We don't have much of a structure built around it. Um, and I'm wondering, and this is an open question, Dr. Exxon, maybe start with you what a U.S.-led security architecture that accounts for our desire in some ways to shift away militarily uh, some of our commitments uh, to the Middle East could look like. Yeah, and there's a tension here, right? Uh, so, you know, the challenge that we've had, uh, we've had a couple different challenges over the past 20, 30 years. We've had a really robust building partnership capacity effort in the Middle East since the Persian Gulf War. It was very clear during that conflict that a lot of our partners in the region were not prepared to stand up against Saddam Hussein's Iraq. So we really started with missile defense, um, recognizing that that was kind of a clear and immediate thing. And that's a place where we have had some success, integrated air and missile defense. The challenge that we've got, and, and you hear this, I mean, we've talked about it several different times during this, uh, during this hearing, um, our partners in the region have, for the past 30 years, accused us of, of leaving the region, accused us of, of abandoning the region. I mean, it's a constant drumbeat. And in fact, um, we really uh, amped up our... Um, uh, our partnership capacity efforts in the region around the time that, um, that David Schenker was in the Bush administration because Condoleezza Rice came back and the late King Abdullah in Saudi Arabia said, look, you Americans are leaving the region. It sent us into a tizzy. We, we said, no, 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 we're committed. We're going to do all this, uh, all this other stuff. I think that the tension that we talk about is the fact that, well, we say that we're going to build up partnership capacity in the region. We want to invest in their militaries. We want them to have independent military capabilities so that we don't have to spend as much time in the region. And they say, no, 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 no. We want you to stay in the region. So in some ways, them investing in independent military capabilities, it's got to be in their interests because um, they're not going to do it just so we withdraw our troops, just so we you know, focus on efforts in southeastern Asia or eastern Europe. This is precisely what they uh, what they fear. And the other challenge that we have is that, again, it's their money, so they can kind of invest in whatever weapon systems and whatever capabilities that they, uh, that they want. I think the key question, and this is something that all four of us have, have touched on at any given time, when you talk about building that security architecture, it is still more, uh, our partners in the region, and this may be changing to the Abraham Accords, I mean, I do think that this really is a remarkable opportunity, but thus far, they have preferred a hub-and-spoke model. 
they prefer to speak to us to, well, we'll coordinate with you, but I really don't want to talk to my neighbors. They're like, well, you guys have been living together for, you know, right next to each other for 2,000 years. What do you mean you don't want to talk to them? Um, but it really is the United States has been the preferred partner. And we've got to get to some sort of um, uh, alternate arrangement where individual states are speaking to one another, their militaries are working with one another, um, uh, in, in part because uh, for certain things like integrated air and missile defenses, it's just absolutely a requirement that the individual states talk to one another. The only challenge that I'll, I'll just flag again, because I always say this, is that if we are successful, the danger is, is that we are successful and they have an independent military capability that they might choose to use in ways that aren't necessarily in line with our interests. That's and we've right. got to be prepared for that, and we've got to be prepared to walk alongside our erstwhile partners you know, for the foreseeable future to make sure that even if our interests aren't always aligned, we still have a robust dialogue. But I don't, I don't know if David or Linda have, have more yeah, to Yeah, please. Uh, it's a, that's really interesting. And I, maybe we do want to remain in the hub and spoke. That's a good point, Dr. Exum. Um, also, to any of y'all, if you want to weigh in, if, if there are any models that we currently have, whether it's OECD or uh, any other, you know, structures you've seen around, uh, are there uh, security structures that actually you think could be a, a model? Feel, feel free to weigh in. Uh, yes, Congressman Alred, thank you. I'll just say briefly, as I said in my prepared statement, I think the OSCE model, Organization of Security Cooperation in Europe, has a lot to recommend it because it's inclusive, which the current regional constructs are not. They're Arab only, uh, but also multi-issue, uh, so that, that countries can also, and this comes from a perspective that security is not just military security. A lot of the threats to the region emanate from things like um, migration, uh, chronic uh, underemployment and unemployment. So it so begins to get a now climate, which is front and center for the region. Uh, and, and it provides a forum for the uh, parties to begin to collaborate and cooperate uh, across the range. I think that NATO, a NATO-like organization, is a bridge too far. And I would, would say against the... Um, that may, may change if we get to a polynuclear Middle East. I mean, this is the specter here, I think, where we're heading with no Iran deal is we could enter into a different era uh, in the future. But right now, I think that a NATO-like organization is, frankly, unlikely. But I think the merits of cooperating among themselves to build a defensive shield uh, is, would answer the immediate pressing threat that they all rank uh, very high on their list, which is the drone and missile uh, threat. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield for your second round of questions. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Allred. All right, it's technically an extension of the one round of questions that we're doing today. Uh, um, <clears throat> thanks so much, and I will, I will try to bring this in for a landing. Um, I, I just, I wanted, I wanted to, talk, to follow up, uh, Ms. Robinson, on, on what you were just saying, I, I want to just finish on on the opportunities ahead. Let me just, Mr. Exum, let me just ask you first. You, you made a point earlier about um, pointing out to other countries what they're missing out on. Can you just elaborate a bit on what that looks like and what what how that argument gets made? Yeah, sure. Envy and rivalry are great motivators in the Gulf, and I, I think you know you see it. Um, I recall when I was, um, you know, working for the Secretary of Defense, uh, one Gulf state came to us and said, look, you know, it's, it's absolutely insane that you guys, you know, fly your, uh, your wounded soldiers from Afghanistan all the way back to Landstuhl in Germany. We'd like to build you a, uh, you know, a hospital for your soldiers. We said, oh, that's great. That's very generous. Two weeks later, we visited another country in the same region. They said, you know, look, it's just, uh, it's, it's crazy that you fly your troops back to Landstuhl uh, from, uh, from Afghanistan. We'd like to build you a hospital. And it's almost as if, I mean, you see this between Qatar and the UAE and Saudi Arabia. They've always got their eye on one another, right? And I, I think certainly under Mohammed bin Salman, what he's been trying to do in Saudi Arabia is he's been looking at the UAE in particular and seeing the dynamism um, of their economy and the way in which they've, they've been able to move their economy past fossil fuels into more service-based economies and, and made the UAE a real transportation hub for the region. Uh, look, he wants to do that exact same thing in, uh, in Saudi Arabia on, on, a, on a greater scale. And you see that uh, the way in which uh, Qatar and the UAE have that same commercial rivalry. I think, frankly, the, the UAE has stolen a march on some of its partner or some of its 
erstwhile rivals slash partners in the, uh, in the region by um, uh, entering into this partnership with Israel. It's going to benefit commercially. It's going to benefit, I mean, when you look at the pools of capital that are in the UAE and the, the tech, 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 tech sector in, uh, in Israel, that's a match made in heaven. Uh, when you look at the two uh, militaries, the way in which they think very similarly about the region and, and think very similarly about how they invest in their capabilities, that's also a match made in heaven. If I'm Qatar, if I am Saudi Arabia, if I am Kuwait, I, I want a part of that as well. And I think that if, if I'm the Biden administration, I'd be, I'd be stoking those jealousies to try to uh, prod some of our, uh, our um, more recalcitrant Gulf partners along in terms of normalizing those relations. You, you think you could prod Qatar along, given the historic way they've approached things, which is to try to be all things to all people in the region? Yeah, I, I, think, you actually, I think you actually could. And in, in fact, um, uh, you know, Probably not the right forum to talk about, but I mean the relations between Qatar and, and Israel are are, um, are somewhat complicated, but are but are also deep in, in other ways. And so I actually think that you uh, you absolutely could. And certainly, if uh, if Qatar sees um, sees the United Arab, Arab Emirates doing one thing, they'll be thinking about something very similar. Um, I think uh, relatively soon. Right. <clears throat> Thank you. And Ms. Robinson, uh, finally to you and, and Ambassador Shapiro. I would just, I'd like to um, go a bit further on what you both talked about. In, in your case, this OSCE model, which you point out should be multi-issue, uh, you touched on some of the issues. Can you tell us, a, a, add a little more about what those issues are and what, what countries might benefit from participating in that structure? Yes, well, we've been uh, talking a lot today about the dynamic movers and shakers of the region, but there are also countries that are just mired in conflict and failed state uh, status. And so I think I'm looking at those as well. And we have also with the combined effects of the Ukraine war, uh, very severe food and water uh, crises in the region. And I think that there is a need for a forum that will begin to help them address ways uh, to address those uh, education uh, programs which really lead to diversification of economies. There are lots of structural things. And the OSCE model has a human basket, security basket, and an economic basket. So that's really the inspiration for looking at this. Uh, kind of new organization that would have that range of issues so that the countries uh, could come together, both those that have critical needs and those in a position such as the Gulf uh, states, and UAE has looked to, uh, to provide, for example, some of the capital for this uh, deal that has been, it's an MOU and not yet implemented, uh, with Jordan, uh, Israel, and uh, provide to provide water in exchange for solar energy. So that, that is the kind of thing. And with the two climate summits now coming, first this year in Egypt and next year in the Emirates, uh, I think there is also a call to really begin there. And if I could just add a brief note, the normalization issue, I think, is so important to talk about the people-to-people -people change. I've focused a lot, and our work looked at the economic modeling, uh, but I think that's really where you begin to see the change in the region at that people-to-people -people level. And I think there are a lot of cultural and education exchanges going on. Haifa University has one. Others are, are growing. And I think that's really the game changer at a fundamental level. And for that to happen, there's an enormous opportunity for the United States to lead that effort. <clears throat> Thanks. And finally, Ambassador Shapiro, uh, while, while we look ahead to the possibility of, of building out that kind of structure, there are some specific things that, that you've touched on uh, that we can be doing now. Um, so I'm going to, in wrapping this up, I'm going to allow you to pick a few of those to highlight. Uh, because I think it, it really puts a, a, a bow on what we've been trying to, to, sure. to do here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there are various steps the United States could encourage and even take itself now uh, that help build the uh, habits and the, uh, and the structures and uh, the exchanges uh, that would reinforce, whether it's an OSCE style, I'm more often focused on an ASEAN style, uh, regional organization that layers in defense, 
and non-defense and economic and people-to-people -people and cultural and educational exchanges all in ways that all reinforce each other. Uh, several that uh, come to mind uh, include uh, an Abraham scholarship uh, and faculty exchange uh, so that uh, students and faculty can attend each other's universities, uh, uh, a forum for uh, not just chiefs of defense, uh, but others in the defense communities in these uh, countries, such as uh, disaster relief uh, and humanitarian uh, response uh, organizations, uh, so that they learn from one another. Uh, there, I mentioned the uh, Prosperity Green and Prosperity Blue uh, energy, uh, uh, solar energy for desalinized water agreement the UAE is funded with Israel and, the, and Jordan. Uh, that could be a model for multiple similar uh, types of uh, cooperative energy initiatives. Uh, health training exchanges, Sheba Hospital uh, in uh, Israel uh, has already uh, announced a number of uh, opportunities for them to provide training in Bahrain. Uh, and in the United Arab Emirates and, and, and do exchanges of that kind. Uh, and uh, there's many more, and some of them are, are mentioned in the, in the testimony. But uh, one thing I think is really uh, necessary and, and one of the things that really uh, can be a product of building out this uh, multilateral regional architecture and organization is that it does two things. It, it builds, fuses an identity, uh, a regional identity uh, among these members so that they see some, themselves as more than the sum of their parts, so that they see themselves having a stake in each other's success, uh, so that uh, as a free trade agreement, let's say, uh, is uh, reached across the region, uh, they have many, many opportunities to deepen exchanges at all levels, but also they as a block can engage the rest of the world. Uh, we should, the United States should, in our own interest, be the key partner of this coalition, but we should have no objection uh, to Europeans uh, or our Asian partners, Japan, Korea, Australia, uh, India already has started with the I2U2, uh, coming as observers, then coming uh, in partnerships uh, with this organization uh, as a bloc. Uh, that will be uh, a, a magnetic force that will encourage other countries that have not yet uh, decided to normalize and uh, begin to integrate uh, to do so. They will see the internal benefits, but also the external uh, relationships that emerge uh, for those who participate. So I think the, the opportunities are immense. I actually believe as much as we should be happy about and celebrate two years into this process what has been achieved, uh, we've really just scratched the surface of what's possible. Uh, and the U.S. should be the key partner uh, in helping take it to the next levels. Uh, here, here. I, um, I want to thank the witnesses. Uh, I want to thank my colleagues, uh, Representative Cicilline, Wilson, Malinowski, Perry, Manning, Mass, Sherman, Jackson, Connolly, Burchett, Schneider, and all red. Um, our witnesses are all experienced. They know that uh, it is a reflection on uh, what they brought to the table today that so many of our colleagues uh, chose to participate in our very busy days. And of all the things that uh, I will miss when I leave Congress, uh, the ability to just simply sit and benefit from uh, the wisdom of people so much smarter and so much more insightful than I uh, is um, right at the top of the list. And that's exactly what today was. I thank our witnesses for being here. Uh, again, I thank uh, the staff, especially Sophie uh, and Jack and Aviva. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, we are adjourned. <laughs>